Hello, everyone, and welcome to another uh, edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I'm your host, John DeLynn. It is so great to have you with us today. We are recording February 17th, 2022. And as always, I am so thrilled to have with me my partner in goodness and truth and righteousness, Kara Burrell. Hey, Kara. Hi. Hi. Thanks hey, for joining. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah. Well, um, Kara, we've got kind of a intense important and more serious episode today. So do you have your, do you have your cap on for that? I do, but I do have a very like kind of outrageous jacket on that probably is not setting the tone for what you just said. It's okay. It's okay. We love the jacket. Thank you. It's a special jacket. All right. Well, today we have a uh, kind of a really uh, sensitive and important topic. The topic for today's episode is when Mormon bishops abuse children. And uh, you really, I think in 2022, maybe at least monthly, there's a story that breaks out where a Mormon bishop abuses a parishioner or, you know, a ward member or a child. It has become very, very common in the news for that to happen. And on the one hand, I don't think we're trying to say that the Mormon church is the only church where abuse happens or where leaders abuse. If you just watch the movie Spotlight with the Catholic Church, you'll know that like something that crazy, like 11% of their priests have been found to be abusing children, like church clergy abuse children sometimes. And uh, it would be impossible to even really know whether it happens more or less in the Mormon church. But that's kind of less important. We know it happens. We know it's happening regularly within Mormonism. We've had several episodes recently about that. But today we're, we're doing something uh, quite different. Uh, today we have with us uh, Colby and Cami. Is that right? That's right. Um, do you guys want to use your last name? Or uh, would you Reddish. Rather? Okay. So it's Colby and Cami Reddish. They are joining us from Idaho. And the, the, the main uh, story today is basically their bishop recently, their Mormon bishop, was released uh, within the past year and uh, now is in prison for uh, sexually molesting two children. And uh, that's, you know, and he's pled guilty. So this is not speculation. This is not rumor mongering. This is, you know, this is a convicted child sex abuser who was their bishop. Now, uh, the abuse happened, as I understand it, before and during his time as bishop. Um, uh, we, we could talk about the details of that. The focus of today's episode um, and we're going to let them also talk about their own intentions, but I just want to give you a heads up of what today's going to be about. Uh, we are going to be talking about what happens, uh, how the Mormon church handles things when, you know, a, a ward member, and even specifically when a bishop is found out to be an abuser, to what extent do they protect the, the abuser at the expense of victims and or at the expense of informing ward or stake members with a particular concern around not smearing the reputation of the abuser, although that may or may not be a problem, but about keeping ward and stake members safe. That's kind of a, a really important point here. So so what happened when Colby and Cami uh, found out about their bishop being a sex abuser and then tried to address the way the ward and the stake were handling it in ways that I think they felt was not um, protecting other members of the ward and stake from also potentially being victims. Um, uh, so so today's episode, from our perspective, at least from care in mind, we want to help the church become better at dealing with abusers and, and particularly with abusers who are leaders in the church so that the Mormon church can be more safe for the people in it. That is at least why Karen and I are very interested in the story, uh, along with just making sure that we can help uh, Mormon church members protect themselves. Because sometimes you can't make an organization safe for people, but you can help make people safer for an organization. So for all those reasons, we're going to be going in detail into what we know about the abuser and um and then how the church handled it, how they mishandled it, and what happened when when Colby and Cami tried to address the problems. And we just hope Curtin and McConkie and the Mormon Church will watch this from start to finish, along with any Mormon Church member that wants to 
stay safe or keep their family members safe, or wants to understand how better to deal with abusers in their ward and stake. We just hope this will be a multi-hour deep dive into the problems so that the, the church can become more healthy and so the members can be more protected. So that's my preamble. That's my um, introduction. And Colby and Cami, what do you guys want to, first of all, welcome, and then thank you. And then what do you guys want to say as kind of an opening uh, intention or disclaimer for for the next few hours? Well, thanks, John. Um, thank you for having us on. Um, one of the reasons that we're here today is because we take the abuse of children seriously. And we think everyone who follows the message of Jesus Christ should, who, who follows that message or claims to follow that message. And so we're here really to speak out against a system. I think that's probably the biggest point we'd like to start with is so often when situations like this happen, whether it's in, you know, the Mormon church or other churches, you hear very commonly, you know, like, well, one bad apple can't spoil the bunch. And I think what our story shows is that the policy coming directly out of Salt Lake and the stakes response, area authorities response to a situation like this just absolutely horrified members like us who are just normal members of the church who had uh, believed in giving ever given everything to the church. And so I think I completely agree with what you said. We want to come on today to help the church be healthier and to help them understand the way that their response in this situation completely affected our family and affected our ward. But I think also we want to send a message to other people in the church about the way the church handles things like this as a matter of policy. Um, I think one of the things we've seen in the last week or so uh, with all the stuff with Brad Wilcox is we don't like to find, and you say this all the time, and I completely agree, we don't want to find fault with individuals. This story, I think, really shows the way the system works and the way the system is designed, and we want to help make that system healthier today. I love it. Cami, what would you like to add about intentions for today? I think that I think that kind of sums it up. Um, I I was in shock when we started going through the process. I think I assumed that most people felt the way that we did, and to find out that it was completely different, that we were made to be crazy. I mean, I honestly considered if I was crazy for wanting to protect the other children in our ward. And so it shocked me. I, I don't think I would have ever imagined that we'd be in a position like this where something that I love and that I trust and that I give all of my time and my energy to, um, I make the church a daily part of my life. And I, I think maybe that I just was going through the motions and I never had asked myself what expectations I had for in return from the church. And so to find something so dramatic happen in our ward and then to see the response, I, yeah, I, I couldn't believe it. And I know we'll get into the story, but, um, I think you said it perfectly that, when good people are willing to do something bad or wrong, um, that you know that there's something, something has gone terribly wrong in that situation. And, and that's what we saw with our, with our ward and stake leaders. Um, they were doing what the church asked them to do. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was not right. I think, I think one thing um, you asked if there's any disclaimers or anything else we want to say, John, I completely agree with what Cami said. And I think because our message today really is about the system, um, I know there's going to be people in our ward and stake who won't understand why we would come and speak out. I think one of the things I want to make sure people know, and they'll see this as we go through the timeline um, that we've been through, is we have tried over and over and over again to get the church, including our new bishop, our stake president, an area authority. We have tried to do this, you know, in quote unquote, the church's right way, tried to address this with them privately, 
and they would not listen. Um, I, um, we, we care so much about doing the right thing that we're here today to say the church is not doing the right thing. And to anyone who would discount what we have to say um, under that, I just wanted to say that, that we have tried over and over and over again to speak with people privately, and we'll get to those conversations. Um, I guess the last thing I want to say before we kind of start telling the story um, or introduce ourselves a little bit more is because this is about systems um, and because, you know, child sexual abuse cases are so delicate and we want to be respectful as much as possible to the victims, we're just going to, even though this person's pleaded guilty and is, you know, has, has been arrested and has pleaded guilty and that's all public information, we're not going to use this person's name out of respect for their family and for the people in our ward. But this is all readily available public information. This person has been reported on over the last year, like you said. So people who know will know. But the point is um, the system is the problem, not necessarily this one individual or even the stake president or the area authority. It's a system that allows for things like this to happen by design. And I think one thing to add to that is the way that this was handled um, my heart just goes out to the victims. What happened to them is not okay. And I'm not sure that they got that message by the way that the people around them responded. And that's what gives me so much anxiety. Um, not to mention, we, we don't know if there were other victims, but what happened to them was wrong and not okay. And I am sad that I am part of the organization that sent them that message. Um, so yeah, I, I hope that they are doing well and that they are healing because it it's awful to, to think that these things happen. Yeah. And as I've read through kind of prepping for this episode, there's also... Uh, in addition to the system of the church, the corporate Mormon church, Kurt McConkie, the legal infrastructure, and the way the church handles abuse, there's also another dynamic of how fellow ward and stake members responded to you guys when you started expressing your concerns. We're going to be talking about that as well. Again, not to throw other ward members under the bus because they're just honestly trying to protect either people or a church that they love. But, but, but there are very unhelpful and unproductive responses by ward members and leaders and stake members and leaders when either a whistleblower or someone expressing concern tries to speak about the safety of everyone that, that has been damaging and harmful. And so that's another part of the system, which is just member and leader response separate from the church that is probably going to be a part of what we talk about today. Correct? It is. And, and just to that, you know, we live in a small community that's um, got a high density population of LDS people. And to those people who we're going to read some of those responses uh, with names and, and things like that redacted so that people can see, because truly when we get to that point, um, you won't believe some of the things that were said as people, I think, try and defend the church. Um, and I guess one of the things I want to say is to those people who will feel wronged that we're sharing their messages, we are not here to find fault with anyone in particular, any individual. That's the truth. Even the stake president, who we'll talk about a lot, I understand that he's a man doing his best that's put in a really tough position. We are here today to say a system that prioritizes itself and requires members to say things that they would otherwise never say in defense of a, a, a child molester or a system um, that wants to support its own authority above all, that's that's what we're here to speak out against. So we're not trying to find fault with anyone, and I hope people can understand that. Yeah, totally. You can already tell this is going to be really impactful. There's nothing I think the church needs more than understanding, church members need more than understanding how they can be helpful within the system, whether they stay in or get out, like yeah. really shining a light on this. So thank you guys for doing this. This is incredible. Yeah. Wow. So part one will be, we're going to just do a, we're not going to go into a deep dive into their Mormon stories prior to the abuse incidences in their ward, but we will give an intro just to give you a sense for the types of Latter-day Saints that they were and in some sense still are. Uh, 
but we won't be doing the traditional deep dive. Uh, then we'll go into in extensive in detail um, the the story the sto- their story about the abuse and how it was handled and mishandled, and then we'll probably come back for a part two where we talk about how this led to their own faith journey, their own faith awakening or discovery. And maybe in part two, it will be about where the abuse stuff, along with their own research, where that has left them with relationship to the church. So that will be a part two. Does that sound all right? Yeah. That sounds great. Okay. All right. So why don't we have each of you kind of tell whatever you want to about your Mormon backgrounds that will help uh, everyone understand where you're coming from as you tell the story about the abuse. Uh, who wants to go first? Oh, I'll go. Okay, Cammie. Um, So I grew up in the church, um, born in the covenant. Um, I have seven siblings. And for most of my childhood, I grew up in the Los Angeles area. Um, so they, it, we had a good ward. Um, everything was a lot more spread out. But I think I didn't really, I don't, I don't know, I didn't really take church seriously. It was a big part of my life. Not a lot of my friends were LDS. So um, it, it might, maybe felt a little embarrassing to me that we were so strict about certain things. But my parents really cared about doing all the things. They were great examples of service. They always were going and doing the right things, the good things that they were supposed to be doing. We never, ever missed family prayer, scripture read. Um, We had family home evening every single Monday. So big part of my childhood was, you know, all the things that the church asks us to do. We were doing all of them. And um, I think I struggled a little bit. My parents were so good and so loving Everything was, everything was um, very spiritual. Everything was a spiritual experience, and and I think I struggled with that because I'm not sure that I felt that I was getting the experiences that my parents would tell me about. And so, just we would go to the grocery store, and my mom had left her wallet on the bumper of the car one time, and. Um, It was there the whole time we drove home and she saw it after. And I remember her telling us that an angel had held her wallet on as we drove home. Or um, when I was 16 or 17, my mom had a dream that we should move. Um, And we, we did, it was, it was just a few months later that we packed up everything and we moved to Colorado. And it was, it was traumatic as a junior in high school to have to leave everything Um, But it was all based on the inspiration that my mom had and our house had sold very quickly and for over asking price. And, and so it seemed, I I don't know, a little bit magical the way that God would put his hand in our life over and over again. And so I did struggle because I felt I wasn't getting, I wasn't getting those experiences like I was told. I mean, she had told stories about running along the side of the road and thinking a car might have swerved into her and an angel grabbing her and throwing her out of the way. And I wasn't experiencing angels and things like I was told. And I would get the same thing at church, honestly, with testimonies. And so I really tried. I remember praying about the Book of Mormon. I remember trying so hard to get the answers that I wanted. I wanted to feel like this was real and a part of me. And I remember when I wouldn't get the answer, I would just work harder and I would, you know, go into the closet to pray because that might make a difference. Um, and, and so I struggled there, but I eventually um, went off to BYU and um, my parents um, really wanted me to serve a mission and I, I finally decided to go. And so it was there that I really felt like I dove in and got the answers that I was looking for. I felt really good about what I was doing and what I was teaching. And I felt like that at that point, it was confirmed to me that this is good and this is true. And Where'd you serve? In Arizona, the Tempe. Oh, Arizona. I served four months in that mission. Oh, really? Yeah. Back yeah. in the day. I, I loved it. I loved my mission. Mm-hmm. It was everything I thought it would be. And I 
I really kind of found myself in the church and it, it kind of became my identity. I don't think I had thought much about it before, but I grasped onto it and I, I found out that I was really good at teaching. And so I dove into the scriptures and I felt like I had understood, I, I understood the gospel. I came home and I taught at the MTC for a few years. I taught at the MTC for long enough that I ended up training teachers how to train missionaries at the MTC and and for our for our not never Mormon listeners, the MTC is the Missionary Training Center in Provo, Utah. There's several throughout the world, but like you said, it, um, Cam, Cam, it's where missionaries are trained. And in in our culture, in Mormon culture, it's it's prestigious to be a return missionary. It's probably even more prestigious to be a female return missionary because traditionally in Mormonism, at least prior to about five or ten years ago, it was pretty much only men that served. Women were more the exception. But if you're selected to teach at the MTC, it's kind of like you were, you're an elite Mormon in a sense, because you weren't just a Mormon missionary and returned with honor, but then you were chosen to train other missionaries. And so at BYU, especially if, if you're a teacher in the MTC, you're kind of extra righteous and you're extra faithful. At least that's how it's perceived within our culture. Is that fair to yeah, say? Yeah. No. And I felt that I felt, I felt really good about it. I thought, I know, I know this stuff and I could handle anything. <laughs> so that's where I was at. I could handle any question because when you train at the MTC and you, you're teaching English, it really is about helping these missionaries understand their testimonies and, and the doctrine. So I am spending hours a day. I mean, I trained hundreds of missionaries and taught them the doctrines of the church. And so from there, um, Colby and I got married in the temple. Um, we have three kids. We have done every calling asked of us. I've served in, served in young women's presidencies and stake primary presidencies. And um, I think my, my involvement in the church has always been about teaching. I, I love it. I, I'm good at it. I feel like I can help when it comes to youth and understanding the gospel. And so, so yeah, it, it really became who I am. Like I, I feel like it, yeah, I, I don't know if I could really separate myself from the church or the gospel because it is, it is who I am. And so, um, yeah, moving into a space where I begin to question what I've given everything to, that is, that is a tough thought to even just have. And, and But just to be clear, prior to discovering that your former bishop had been an abuser, where was your testimony? Were you like, were you like looking for reasons to get out of the church? Were you like, you know, doubting the church and, and, and struggling or were you like, or, or something else? No, what? I mean, I, my testimony in the gospel was strong and, and I would, I think that we were struggling in a way completely different to that. Um, almost going because we knew the church was true and because it was so, my testimony was so strong. We struggled with things like COVID. Um, we have a high risk son. So to, to attend a ward who isn't masking. And I know there, there are so many opinions on that, but that felt difficult to us because we thought, Hey, like we want to be here. Like this is the true church. Like, and, and, even that wasn't going to stop us from participating in the church, even though we were frustrated and upset about how at least our ward was responding. Um, we knew it was true. And when we couldn't participate in person, we participated online and we would always do our family prayer and scripture read. And um, I believed that it was all of God and I wanted to be good and I wanted to do the right thing. Yeah. So. so prior to this bishop abuse scandal, you were super faithful, super committed, yeah. and super believing. Yeah. True? Yeah. Okay. True. All right. Well, Colby, what do you want to tell us about your Mormon background prior to this scandal? Well, as you can tell, my wife's amazing. Um, I feel like I grew up um I feel like I grew up in just a fantastic family. Um, my parents, we were really good about uh, prayer and and we would do scripture study as a family. Um, but one of the things I think I really want to just like praise my parents for, for my upbringing um, was just 
the church has this list of rules, um, and we all know what they are, right? My parents were so much more focused on us being good people, and I think the core of what um, Christianity is. Um, so, for example, we, you know, I have one sister. Um, I never remember feeling like the weird um, oppression about like modesty for her, and maybe she would disagree. I don't know. But I just felt like um, my upbringing, it definitely was super Mormon, um, but it was a little less uh, orthodox, I'd say, than my wife's. And I mean that in a good way. Um, I meant that, you know, my parents were primarily committed to, and I'm not saying hers weren't, but my parents really were committed to us being good, honest people, standing up for other people if they were, you know, going through something tough. Um, and reaching out to those around us, my, both of my, uh, extended family, like my mom and dad's side are LDS. My mom's side though, um, she has four brothers and none of them really are active. And so growing up, um, with that, they're just these awesome, fun, you know, kind of cowboy guys, um, did rodeo and stuff. And they're just great people who weren't super active in the church, um, growing up. And so, I would say one of the reasons I had a little bit more of like a universalist view, I think, than most Mormon people was that. And I think that experience looking back was really important to see that the church isn't the only place with good people. Um, but like Cami, so I feel like I grew up pretty traditional. Um, Cami told her story about the angel holding on the wallet. I think the only story I'd tell as a kid that really affected me was um, I remember getting the lesson in Sunday in primary about Jesus and Peter walking on the water. And I remember being told by primary teachers for years that if I had enough faith, just like Peter and Jesus, I could walk on the water. And I never told anyone this until I told Cammie like a few months ago, but growing up for like years, I would, you know, when I, whenever I was at the local pool or um, around water, I would try and like believe that I could walk on the water and like, you know, close my eyes, step onto the water and uh, obviously never walked on the water. Um, but I remember as a kid, even that that really did cause me like the beginnings of some cognitive dissonance. Like I was hearing, well, and the weird thing was it isn't, it wasn't really even cognitive, cognitive dissonance. I internalized that as like, there was something wrong with me or that I didn't have enough faith um, but I would say I like moved past those feelings. And then like Cami, I went to BYU, uh, served a mission also in Tempe. So that's where oh. we met each other and then started dating later at BYU. Um, I also taught at the MTC. And then while I was at BYU, I TA'd for Professor Thomas Waymont and then ended up going to law school. And I'm an attorney today. Um, as far as our relationship to the church, I think you kind of nailed it, John, which is we were all in type members um, right up until this whole thing um, was a real challenge for us. Um, for the last like four years uh, before this all happened, I was actually the adult gospel doctrine teacher in our ward. And so I taught all four of the standard works and just really enjoyed that. Um, I've always really enjoyed teaching and communicating with people. And so I really tried to bring like a new perspective to gospel doctrine. And I think I did that over the years um, and gave people some insights that they maybe hadn't heard before. Um, I think one of the things Cami said, I just highlight is there were things we recognized in the church that we didn't agree with um, dating back since the beginning of our marriage, but we chalked those things up to church culture, right? So we felt like there were things in the church's culture that were unhealthy but for some reason, we never connected the two dots that like maybe those things were a direct result of things the church was teaching. Um, for example, the two that come to mind is like we were really worried about the church's messaging about sexuality and sexual health for our kids as we started to have kids. And then for LGBT individuals, we were really we really felt like the church was in the wrong, but we felt like that was a culture problem, not necessarily a doctrinal problem. So I think that I only raised that to show how much Cammie and I believed in the doctrine and how much we believed the church was true, that we recognized some of the problems and went 
almost like in spite of the culture sometimes. All right. Love it. Okay. So both of you were super faithful. So how many years into your marriage, uh, were you when, when things started, when, when, when this stuff started happening in your, in your ward? And do you want to say what city ward and stake you were in, or do you want to leave that out? I think we'd rather just leave that. Um, like we said, this is mainly about the system. People can find that pretty easily. I think, um, it happened in Idaho. And so people can find that if they want to, but I think out of respect for, you know, the ex bishops family, um, we, we won't, give that information, even though people can find that. So this all began happening in January, 2021. That's really where this timeline starts. That was last year. And this year is our 10th anniversary. So we've been married nine years and that's really where this story starts. All right. Well, let's, uh, I guess let's, let's get into it. So you're, you're both serving, you have some kids, you've been married nine years. You're serving faithfully in your Idaho Mormon ward. How did it start? So it starts um, January 2021. We had a really weird releasing of this person we'll just call ex bishop, who ended up being charged with you know four counts of child mol- serious child molestation charges. Um, it was the weirdest releasing I've ever seen. Because how, how long had he been bishop? He had been bishop a little over a year, year and a half, maybe. Yeah, a year it was and pretty half. recent. Okay, and with him but he served for a full year or more. Yeah, yeah, I believe bishop. so. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that sounds about right. Okay. Um, so he, it was the weirdest releasing I've ever seen because the stake president came. And well, I should, I should just tell non-Mormons. Bishops in Mormonism traditionally serve five years. So it's if, if a bishop's released before five years, it's usually a signal to the church members that something's gone wrong. Sorry, I just wanted to provide that context. No, yeah, absolutely. And that's actually a great point because we actually had a bishop right before this individual who was bishop for like three or four months, and then their work schedule changed such that they couldn't do it. And the stake president came, and when they released him, for people who aren't familiar with it, it's such a thing in Mormon culture that if someone's released ahead of time and there isn't like a worthiness problem, they'll address it kind of directly and, and give reasons for why that person's being released here. So the stake president was there on a Sunday. The, the Bishop who was being released was not, um, nor was his family. And the Bishop got up and released him with no thank you or vote of thank you. The new Bishop got up. I'm sorry. The stake president got up and released the old, old Bishop. And there was no thanking his family, no thanking him. Um, no vote of thanks, which I think is pretty standard. Um, and instead they called the current first counselor to that bishop to be the new bishop and the second counselor to be the first. And for n- never Mormons, a stake president is over like eight, let's just say eight to 10 Mormon congregations. So it, it's like a diocese in the Catholic church. So usually a stake president and it's S T A K E not S T E A K stake president, like stakes in a tent, the stake president presides over multiple Mormon congregations. And so they would come to release old bishops and to call new ones. And uh, so normally it's like this celebration of like, oh, Bishop, thanks for serving for five years. You've been great. Thanks to your wife. Now we release you and we'll bring on new ones. So normally it's a celebration. So if the Bishop's not there and they're just like, here's the new one and let's not talk about the old one. That's clearly an alarm sign, right? Yeah, it was definitely very different. I think another standard thing is the outgoing bishop usually gets up and like either gives a talk or at least shares a testimony. Yeah. Um, And so that was really irregular. Yeah. 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 Okay. So the stake president comes, releases the old bishop without much fanfare, four years, four, three and a half to four years early, doesn't talk much about him, calls the first counselor as the new bishop. And so that leaves the whole ward wondering what. <laughs> yeah, that's the question, right? It, we all know that, well, people who've grown up around Mormons know that like the rumor mill in Mormonism is a real thing, right? Especially in a small community where I grew up in this community. Um, so we had heard some, some gossip and just kind of lodged it away as like, well, that was a weird thing. I wonder what we'll end up hearing when the story's kind of resolved. And then that well, really brings us to Yeah, it, it brings us to where. This bishop is our neighbor as well, the ex-bishop. 
And so literally next door neighbor, uh, down the street. Okay. Same street, same street. Um, so we see him move out and everything. We see him move his boat and, um, moving truck, everything moves out. Um, and so we know that something has happened, but again, the rumors were it's an affair, something, you know, something's gone wrong. Let's not talk about it. And honestly, an affair, none, none of our business, right? He, so we kind of let it go at that point. So months are going by and, um, nothing's happened. All we know is our Bishop has been released and nothing's been done. He moves out of his house. So we know that there's something there. Um, but he's been seen, he's seen around town multiple times. Does his wife and kids, do they stay in the church in the, in the house? Uh, yeah. So the yeah, family, the know. family remains just the, the ex-bishop, ex-bishop moves, moves out. out. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, but I mean, he's seen, so, um, dropping off his son at activity days. Smallish town. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, yeah. yeah. So he's still at stuff. Right. Yeah. And, and during this time, I'm, he's still, we have a ward Facebook page, probably like most. So he's showing up to service stuff. Um, so he's still showing up about to him. He's in pictures right on the ward Facebook page. Um, and then I don't, how many months go by? It was three. So then in April, so the release, the weird releasing happens in January. And then in April, one day I'm driving home. And as an attorney in the past, I've worked as a criminal prosecutor. And so it's pretty common that I'll get, you know, weird criminal law questions from family or friends. I get a call from someone saying, have you heard about, you know, this individual and the charges that were filed? And I said, no. And they were calling because charges had been filed for lewd and lascivious conduct and sexual assault of a child under 16, two counts of each of those. And they were calling to say, basically, how serious is this? Like, what can you find out by looking at this public information? Because if you're not an attorney and you don't work in that system, it can be hard sometimes to figure out exactly what you're looking at. So that was in April when charges were officially filed and he was arrested. Okay. So you, you found this out in April. Yes. And then what goes through your mind? Well, in reality, we think, we think it's so common sense, right? That everyone's just going to be very hands off. Um, as far as we need to love and rally around his family because his family didn't do anything wrong. Um, but I thought, wow, this is a really difficult situation. Um, I knew that it was going to be very contentious um, because it's one of the things I learned from my time as a prosecutor is people don't know how to handle child sex abuse in the States. They really don't. Um, There are so many people who believe that it looks like, you know, strangers in white paneled vans taking people away and statistics indicate that that's just not the reality. And so a lot of times people are just very uncomfortable with it and don't know what to say, what to do. The vast majority of abusers, as I understand it, are close, trusted family or friends. Loved and trusted and adored people. And by the way, part of the way they are able to groom and cover up sexual abuse is by being so loved and adored and trusted. Yeah, I mean, you know, that's what, what I understand. Yeah. And my original, I mean, my original concern, when I say this is so common sense, I just thought, okay, wow, this is really sad for his family. This is really sad. Even for him, I like still human, he's still human. And I can't imagine knowing as a father that you've affected your child, like your children are going to be labeled as something when they didn't do anything wrong. Um, so I have sympathy for you know, people who find themselves in the criminal justice system, whatever the cause is, because it can be really tough. And when I, I guess the other piece of background that's important is to know that before this individual was bishop, they had served with the youth the entire time we've been in this ward, um, you know, six, About seven years. years. That was eight years. We yeah. Lincoln was 10 months. So that was my other concern was, wow, so if these charges have been filed, know, how far down does this go? What's the story? What's the church going to do about it? And the charges that had been filed dated back, um, beginning 10 years prior. And so I don't know. I, I think that there were a lot of people who misunderstood or had different impressions about what was actually going on. And at this point, when he had told me, I, I think I just assumed the state president's going to take care of this. 
right? The stake president loves us and cares about us. He cares about the children in our ward. Like he is going to make sure that we are safe, that the other kids in our ward were safe. I mean, we have seen kids have activities at his house all the time. Like we have seen the amount of time he has spent with the youth. He has been to girls camp. He has been to scout camp. He has been to all of these places. I saw this as this is going to take some time and some work. And although it's going to be contentious, I had all the faith that the stake president was going to make sure that everybody knew and everybody knew what kind of conversations they needed to have with their children to make sure they were safe. And there's so many cultural layers here that I just want to call out uh, again for everyone, but also for our never Mormon listeners, which is half our audience. Number one is that uh, Mormon leaders are well, LDS church members are taught that there's no difference between God's voice and the voice of, you know, God's servants, meaning their bishops and stake presidents and general authorities. So in other words, God calls the leaders um, and the leaders speak for God in the Mormon church. That's not hyperbole. I'm not exaggerating. That's in the doctrine and covenants. And the, and the literal words of the scripture are whether by mind voice, this is God or Jesus speaking, whether by mind voice or by the voice of my servants, it is the same. And so Mormons trust their leaders, but most importantly, trust their bishops because they're taught that bishops are called by God. And by the way, a bishop has to, a bishop has to be approved by Salt Lake church headquarters. Um, and, and so like the first presidency and the prophet are, are literally approving these bishops. And so a Mormon, a, a Mormon would believe that the bishop is called by God. A Mormon would believe that they should trust their bishop, that their bishop speaks for God. And then, and then Mormon bishops are regularly, it's like the main part of their job description is to meet one-on-one -on -one alone with men, women, and children behind closed doors. And so when you add all those three, three things together, that, that these leaders are literally called by God, that they speak for God, and that you're allowed to, that, that they're supposed to get people alone one-on-one -on -one behind closed doors, I hope you're doing the math and connecting the dots of why this is such a problem and why monthly now we're seeing news reports of another bishop who's abused a kid or another bishop who's abused a teen or another, you know, seminary or institute teacher that's been abusive because the members are trust are giving an unhealthy level of trust to their leaders, to their bishops, to their stake presidents. And they're allowing their children and their youth to sit alone with these men in, in behind closed doors. And for all those reasons, it's deeply problematic. Maybe I'm leaving something out. But. Well, the one thing I would point out too, John, I completely agree with everything you just said. But the other thing I point out is so often when you hear about cases like this, believing members of the church will go to apologetic places and say, but what about agency, right? Bishops still have their agency. And they'll say that, People who are being critical of situations like this are expecting too much out of the gift of discernment. And I think that's one of the reasons this case, this situation is important to note is because the charges dated back 10 years. This isn't someone who, um, when you look at it as criticizing the church leaders for calling this person, it's not criticizing them for not having foresight or foreknowledge. It's criticizing them for going through interviews with somebody who was unworthy when called, who was abusing children before he was called and maybe while he was called and having absolutely no gift of discernment to realize that. Um, that makes me really sad. And Mormons are taught that their leaders have this gift of, of assessing. I mean, the bishop is called a judge in Israel and a stake president would be that with superpowers, right? Uh, we talked, we, we interviewed someone just a week or two ago where like when they shake the hand of a general authority, they assume the general authority can peer into their soul and see whether they're, you know, doing something wrong. But, but, but of course a stake president Mormons are taught would be able to discern the worthiness of a man before he got called as Bishop. And that's what we're all led to believe. And 
Yes, maybe it's unfair to expect that, but we're taught it. And because we're taught it, then we trust these leaders way more than we ever should. And this is churchwide. Four million Mormons right now trust their bishops as if their bishops are God or Jesus because they're taught to, because they're taught that they, that they're, whoever called them had the ability to discern their worthiness before they ever got put in that position. So of course a bishop would never be called who was an active child abuser. Of course that would never happen. Right. And you know, it's uh, president Irene gave a talk. It, I think it was in 2017. So for people who are thinking, well, John, you don't have that exactly right. That's not exactly what the church teaches. Look at elder Irene or president Irene's talk where he says it takes faith to believe that the savior makes these callings and knows people's weaknesses and strengths. I mean, I well, know I will add that to the show notes. This yeah, is an Irene talk about, about specifically about callings in the church and about how every calling comes directly from the savior. Okay. I, I, I don't know how with the pattern of like, you've put it, you know, cases like this happening multiple times a year across the church, a leader in the church can make a statement like that because I don't, I don't know how to interpret that when then you have a situation like this. And I guess that then gets us to the next um, part. Like Cammy and I said, we just thought this was so common sense that people would just be all on board with, you know, child molestation is not acceptable. The church stands against abuse in any form, right? That's the line from the handbook. And the next part of the story is like a month or so later, um, our new bishop was um, getting up and, and testifying during fast and testimony meeting. And it's, I think it's kind of important to remember the weirdness of how COVID affected everything here because this, the releasing happened in January before COVID had kind of gone through another wave and shut everything down. Um, but at the time that the, the, bit, the new bishop gives this uh, talk and fest and testimony, we this testimony, we were listening at home. I'm sorry, no, we weren't at home. We were there. That's right. There, we were there because we were teaching Sunday school for the youth at the time. Um, the new, the new bishop gets up and I want to give him credit in the sense that he was trying to be humble. The message he was trying to say, because he, this was right after he'd been called more or less, he was trying to say, I'm imperfect. The Lord works through imperfect people. But as part of that statement, what he said was he specifically referenced this ex bishop who was, who had been arrested for child molestation at this point. He specifically mentioned him by name and said how he had learned from him when he was bishop and this person was first counselor. And he mentioned other bishops too, um, like the, the past two bishops of the word as well. But that was insane to me. So offensive and tone deaf to basically extol this person over the pulpit when we knew there were victims sitting in that chapel at that very moment. We were... Praising horrified, him, praising, praising him, the abuser, basically praising the abuser and saying he was a good guy and how much service he had given. So I immediately scheduled a conversation with the stake president because I just thought there's no way this is okay. Well, and also I think we had been kind of waiting for the stake president to handle this situation. There were already rumors. So I mean, now that this is public information, he's been arrested for these things. A few people have called Colby asking, what are these, what does this mean? What does this not mean? But I had heard the same exact rumor over and over again from other people in the ward that this was a misunderstanding. This was not what it seems. And so I'm, I'm getting really confused. Like, is the stake president going to set the record straight? Are they going to help these people understand that there are, this is serious, I think that's the big thing is it, it was just rampant in the ward. Like this isn't very serious. It's kind of not a, not a big deal. Um, and when people are saying that over and over again, and I have a lawyer here that's telling me, no, this is what this actually means. I am very confused and I'm waiting for the state president to kind of tell everybody actually like. I care about you guys. This is really serious for the sake of the victims and you. I want you to know how serious this is. And I want you to know that you probably need to talk to your kids so that we can make sure everybody who's been in his care 
one-on-one in group activities, whatever has felt safe. And none of that has happened yet. So it sounds like if I were to ask you guys what you would have wanted the, the following Bishop or the stake president to tell congregation members, ward members or stake members is basically let them know this guy's a threat, let, the, or at least a, you know, convicted let, the, or, or on trial, I don't know the right yep. legal terms, let the, you know, he's running around the community, make sure that they protect themselves, find out if there's been other victims and, uh, and make sure that everyone can guard against any future abuses. You would, you would, that's what, that's the minimum you would want from a Bishop or stake president. Is there more? Well, we thought it would have been like situations like this can tear wards apart. I was in a uh, ward in my mission in Arizona where it wasn't exactly child molestation, but there was something like an affair between two high level members of a ward. And they had like an entire fifth Sunday basically to air out all of this stuff. And so I couldn't believe that the stake president wasn't using it as an opportunity to talk about abuse to say what happened to these victims is not okay. And yeah, like you said, I believe every parent in that ward, every parent whose kids had been alone with that man, when public information indicates that he is a, a, a child abuser, that they had a right to talk to their kids however they wanted to, that that was a decision the parents got to make, that the church had a duty to say, parents, these charges have been filed and they don't have to editorialize and, and you know, besmirch this person's reputation. They just have to give the publicly available information so that people can make their own informed decision to talk to their children. Yeah. And because he had been at girls camp and in, you know, young men's leader, these are, these are positions where you're potentially alone with, with girls or boys. And, and again, as a bishop for a year, he was meeting alone behind closed doors with women and children. Yeah, so and it's, it, it's a fair, it's a fair expectation. Right. And it might, I mean, it might sound silly to some of the listeners who don't agree with the book of Mormon, but the first place my mind went immediately was Jacob, where in the book of Jacob, he gives a really harsh sermon about chastity and about cleanliness. And he specifically has a line where he talks about, you know, it grieves me that I have to speak in front of you with such boldness. And I thought, here's an opportunity for like a real leader, like a real stake president to come in and say, this is a really unfortunate situation, but we need to talk about this. And it could have helped make the ward stronger and better and helped. Um, I felt like at least at the time, like teach people about that. The church doesn't stand for this type of stuff. Um, aside from just the new Bishop's comment, I think it's important to note we had heard like, Cammy said a few comments from other people like, well, this is just a misunderstanding or they had heard, you know, a gossip about a gossip about a really minimized version and how it was just, you know, blown out of proportion. And, you know, when charges have been filed and someone's been arrested, it's important to know that's not just, it's an allegation that hasn't been proven beyond a reasonable doubt, but it's not nothing, right? It's not just someone gossiping there is a judge who sat and heard whether or not there was enough information from the state to go arrest this person. And the judge said, yes, there that's built into the system, right? It wasn't just hearsay rumor. There was, there was evidence that police and judges had looked at and a prosecutor and felt like this was more likely than not that this person had committed these crimes. And now of course it's worked its way through the criminal justice system and he's pleaded guilty. So He's even acknowledged that, you know, at least the things he pled guilty to, that they did happen. So. Hmm. Okay. So you are becoming more and more alarmed at the stake president and bishop not informing the membership to keep them safe. Yeah. What happens next? So after the comment by our new bishop, um, who's also our neighbor, um, <laughs> we. In, in Utah and Idaho. All your award members are basically your neighbors, yes. right? Yeah, basically. Yeah, yeah. So we, um, which makes being here a little harder, right? Um, and I hope people can realize that, um, that we have good intentions, but. Because you have to go back to your neighborhood where all of your neighbors 
are also ward members. Right. And they're going to feel in some way like you betrayed the ward or the church or them by speaking publicly. And then you have to live in that, you know, environment. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. we're adults, but our kids have to live in that environment. Yeah. And I guess the unfortunate thing for us is that someone taught us do what is right. Let the consequence follow. <laughs> Oops. And we take that teaching very seriously. And that's, I mean, that's why we're here today. Like I, I want our kids to understand someday when they can listen to this, that this meant enough to their mom and I, that we had to speak up and say that this situation was not handled correctly and that it needs to change. Yeah. And if people treat us poorly, because of that, we can pay that price because we care enough about children. To get back to what happened next. So after that extolling over the pulpit, after this person had been arrested for child molestation, I immediately scheduled a, an, an interview or a meeting with the stake president and just kind of said, uh, started by saying like, explaining what had happened and saying, this was not okay. Um, and you correct me if I'm wrong, um, and to his credit, he agreed with me that that was very poor wording. That's a common explanation for, <laughs> I feel like, uh, things that are said that are kind of horrifying in Mormonism. Um, but he agreed to talk to the bishop. Um, he, I basically explained that I was really disappointed in the way that he'd handled the situation, in the way that we just talked about. Um, I shared with him the story about the ward on my mission and how it was a real opportunity for transparency and for that ward to move forward and grow. And so I was surprised that he hadn't done anything about that. Um, he also, and I, I want to tell this story. Um, I did not go and ask whether or not the ex Bishop was called of God because I already knew that the God I believed in would not put um, a child molester in those rooms with bishops or with children um, and put children at risk. I did not believe that. I did not ask that question because I didn't want the answer or I didn't want to hear his answer. Mm -hmm. Frankly, enough people had come and talked to him concerned about the situation that he volunteered the answer anyways, um, which was also very horrifying. He said, and I was alone at this. Cause he would have yes. called the original Bishop. He called this Bishop. Yes. <laughs> and he told me um, that he wanted to testify that the Lord had called this Bishop and that sometimes the Lord works in mysterious ways. He just, he bore your stake president bore testimony to you that God chose that child molester to be a Bishop because the Lord works in mysterious ways. Yeah. And I want to be really clear. I do not expect perfection of church leaders if this stake president would have just told me, you know, I had a feeling because that's, we know that's how the spirit works. I had a feeling and I felt like I was doing what was right, but truthfully, I don't know. I would have probably dropped at least this part of the story, but that is so damaging. I mean, I can't imagine putting myself in the shoes of those victims and knowing that they were abused. <laughs> that the person who called the abuser points the finger right at God rather than just admit I may have made a mistake. I think that's the part getting back to our theme of systems, not people. That's the part that horrifies me is because Mormonism takes people otherwise good people and puts them in a position and tells them you speak for God. They'll do this weird mental gymnastics where they actually denigrate God to save their own perceived infallibility or their own image or their own reputation. To be fair, I don't think that most people, I've heard that before. I don't think most people who say things like that have thought that through. I don't think they would have been able to rephrase it and be like, I think God wanted him there, even though that's exactly what they're saying. I think if they took a moment and thought, oh, wow, yeah, I am making this God's fault. I am saying, yeah, God wanted him to be there. And I, 
we kind of get so wrapped up in just the things that we say, you know, it, it's just these common things that they do sound beautiful in some situations. Like my mom's stories sounded beautiful to me when I was young, but the internal struggle that came from those angels showing up all the time. I'm thinking now, why didn't an angel show up to this stake president and give him a dream <laughs> right. that he was not supposed to call this man? I don't understand. I'm starting to rethink yeah. how I've been understanding my entire life. I mean, it's, it's Mormon history. It's, it's accepted Mormon history that according to Joseph Smith, when God wanted him to marry some teenage girl, that God sent an angel with a flaming sword to threaten Joseph's life to force him against his will to marry a teenage girl. That's Mormon history. That's accepted Mormon history. Like if God's sending angels with flaming swords, what God should have done is sent an angel with a flaming sword to keep that stake president from calling that man as bishop, right? Or or I'd say to prevent the abuse in the first place, yeah, right? Even, of course. Right. Even, yeah, even Better, more so. Yeah. Right. Yeah. What's that thing you always say, John, where it's like, the church cares about two things and it's like authority and, 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 pub, and PR and PR. Yeah. And so for and you could add, you could add money. And I don't, I think the church cares about its members. Yeah. I'm just trying to say like, I think in that situation in the stake president's head, his authority trumps everything else. Right. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. yeah individual right. members can care about different things. The church can genuinely care about a broad array of things. But when you're talking about authority and if your authority is being questioned, and you're like a big, strong, tough guy. <laughs> you're not willing to be like, "Ooh, you're right. I should take a seat now." That's not really in a in like a Mormon authority, uh, like a stake president's playbook. No, you're making a great point, Kara. That we're not going to say that the church doesn't care about its members. The church cares about its members. The church cares about its doctrine, its theology. But when push comes to shove, if it's if it's the church's authority, if it's the truthfulness of the church or its reputation, members will get stepped on and pushed aside if they do anything that could challenge the church's authority or reputation, I think. We absolutely agree <laughs> with that, John. As people who have felt completely stepped on because we've tried to speak truth to power, yeah. um, I agree with that wholeheartedly. The church does care about its members, um, but like you said, when there's a conflict— the church's authority is the most important thing. That's one of the biggest things. That's one of the biggest reasons we're here today is we don't want to draw anyone away from the church if it works for them, but we want people who are in the church to understand the way the church works so that they can make their decisions about how they define their relationship to the church accordingly. They need to understand that this is the way the church works. Um, I One thing I want to say about that meeting um, Cammie wasn't able to make it that meeting. So it was just he and I, um, I wish for the life of me, I had recorded that meeting. Yeah, I haven't, or I didn't, uh, I haven't recorded any of the meetings because at the time I, I really felt like these people just that they had blind spots. Right. And I felt like if I go to them respectfully and try and say, I think there's a problem with the way you handled this or the way this was said or done. I really believe that they would say, oh my gosh, thank you so much for the helpful feedback <laughs> and would adjust accordingly. Mm -hmm. um, that didn't mm -hmm. turn out to be the case all that much. Um, and I guess just the one thing I want to say is I, I want to be very clear that that interaction happened, mm -hmm. um, even though I can't prove it. Yeah. People who work with me in the professional capacity or who know me know that I would never, like, I don't lie. I just don't. Yeah. Um, and I specifically remember that interaction because it took me so off kilter. It just was so offensive to me. And I remember it went even a little farther than that because he said, he tried to like theorize, right? He said, well, maybe the abuse wouldn't have come out and it would have continued or gotten worse Ooh. if he hadn't been called as a bishop. So that well, was- Calling him as a bishop was a way for the Lord to get him eventually busted and prosecuted. For the, for the abuse. Right, right. And yeah, that was mysterious. a long... <laughs> mysterious way. Uh, yeah, and so the stake president, I would know also the stake president, as that meeting closed, um, I offered to just, you know, 
I'm an attorney who's worked in the criminal law sphere. I have dealt with victims before. I know a little bit about how this works. I'm happy to help or be used in whatever way possible um, because the stake president had asked if I'd be willing to like counsel with him going forward if he needed to run stuff by um, someone. Uh, that never happened. <laughs> and it's a little frustrating when you have a leader like make offers like that and then they just completely seem to forget. And I bring that up because the next part of the story is that rather than do like an adult only fifth Sunday, like I had well, mentioned. No, that was after the second time we met. This is still the first time where you asked him what he was going to do. Yeah. And he had no idea. So then we had the weird sacrament meeting. Oh, okay. Yeah. But your, your conversation with him about what he was going to do to, 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 to address this. Um, he said, I'm taking care of that in oh. private meetings. So what she's talking about is the concern I raised that other people don't know about this and don't know they need to be having these conversations with their kids. I, I, what I actually said to him was if this person had interviewed my kid and you haven't told me now for four and a half months, we would be having a very different conversation right now. Our kid uh, was younger than the seven. He wouldn't have gotten his first interview until he was eight. Right. Baptized. And so he hadn't been alone with this person, but I was trying to express to the stake president you need to tell people or what are you doing to tell people so that they can have conversations with their kids so that you actually know the scope of this problem. Cause my understanding about child abusers is that they, they repeat offend. It's yeah. once they become abusers and he had been an abuser for 10 years at this point, or nine years when he'd been called as Bishop, whatever it was, who knows how many people he might've abused because it's very rare for a child sex abuser to just abuse one or even two kids. That's my understanding. I don't know if that's, you know, I, that's my understanding having a training in mental health. So, so it would stand to reason that there would be other victims in the wake. Right. Right. And you never know if you don't ask, yeah. right. There yeah. might not be. St yeah. I think you're right. The statistic statistics indicate that that's probably the case with someone who's, you know, sexually attracted to children. But you don't know if you don't give people the information to have the conversations yeah. with their children. Yeah. What the stake president told me at the time was, the, so your kids, because your kids weren't affected, you didn't have like a conversation with the bishop, but those conversations are happening behind closed doors so that people can talk to their kids. You just weren't involved because you didn't have kids of that age. So at the time I said, uh, well, I don't necessarily agree with the way that's being handled, but out of respect for his family, for the victims, I at least felt like, okay, well, they're at least telling people in some way. They're doing something. They're not doing it the way I would, but they are doing something. And so that kind of cooled me off on that that part at that point. Okay. Okay, so then we go into the sacrament meeting. This is the weird one. Yeah, so about Strange. a month later... This was, I think really this was the stake president's attempt to recreate my pitch of like a, you know, a fifth Sunday or an adult only fireside. Go ahead. Oh, I mean, I, he's there. Um, the stake president shows up. He's there for as the sacrament meeting, meeting yes. for your ward. He speaks after the ex-bishop's wife. So what? he has the ex-bishop's wife. On? It was on forgiveness. Oh, so he has the ex-bishop's wife give a talk about loving and forgiving. She did not explain what happened. She said something happened in our um, family. Um, and it has led her to find herself in a place of forgiveness and kindness. And he followed with a talk about forgiveness. And it felt very, I don't know, like... I was confused why that was the conversation because I feel like we missed a step in the conversation. I can see in somewhere in this plan that the forgiveness takes place, um, but we kind of like skipped a bunch of stuff. And our ward is super messed up at this point with all the rumors going on. There, Very few people know exactly what happened. And people are saying all sorts of things. I mean, people are 
still saying he's a good guy and defending him. And other people are saying it wasn't really what they say. It's just this big fight. There's definitely sides. It's and vague. so we get it's just super vague. Yeah. We, we get a sacrament meeting about forgiveness. So just to kind of like summarize the, the wife of the abuser is asked and or pressured by the state president to get up and give a talk about forgiveness while the victims are in the congregation and uh, the family members of the victims are in the congregation hearing this, knowing that the context is, is that there's pressure now on friends and family and ward members to immediately forgive the abuser uh, when it's only three or four, four or five months into this whole process and people finding out about everything. I mean, yeah, and, it's kind of and stunning. not having it not be addressed, having there be 10 different stories about out there about what happened. I think it was a lot of confusion. And then it's, it's like kind of like trying to push the ward into the next phase when we didn't actually process what happened. Because at that point, I don't think most people knew what happened. And it was, a, it was just a mess. I mean, I actually, one of the really good teachings of Mormonism are these steps of repentance mm -hmm. where you acknowledge the wrong, you admit it. That, those are like the first steps. You acknowledge that you did something wrong and you admit it. And then you apologize for it. And then you can make restitution and then you can, you know, not do it again and change your heart and not do it again. If we're thinking about collectively the, the, the ward, the, the stake, the stake president, there was no acknowledgement publicly of what happened um, so that it could be identified. That, that's step one. And they just skipped right, right over their own steps of repentance. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And I think it also just ignored the way that something like this affects everybody because the stake president, I specifically remember him making a comment about following the ex-bishop's wife's lead. And I remember, I don't like have the text of that entire talk, but I remember telling Cammy my impression right after it was over was, oh my gosh, this is going to get completely swept under the rug and he's just going to go back home like nothing happened. That was the, that was the takeaway from this talk was that it was all good now. We're all going to move past and we all need to forgive. So the clear signal to the entire ward was this is over and done with. And it's important to note that there were no specifics given there. It was very vague because it was in sacrament meeting. And of course you don't necessarily want to talk about specifics of child abuse in front of a bunch of children, right? We need to be age sensitive, but that really bothered me. The fact that it was so, so vague because there had never been specific communication about what had specifically happened. And like you said, taking accountability is a part of the repentance process, right? The atonement shouldn't be used to jump over all of the steps and say the possibility that this person could one day be forgiven because of the savior means that we should forgive them right now. And that's very much what I felt like the ward members, including us, were being asked to do was let this go. It didn't affect you because it affected these other people more. But the reality is it did affect the entire ward. Yeah. And then I think maybe the most important and shocking and disturbing part of all this is when, what does it do to victims to have them be sitting in the room while, while their perpetrator has not been sufficiently identified and called out? And then all the leaders are saying, forgive, 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 jump right to forgiveness. What's that like for a sexual abuse victim to not have any, no public discussion of like, oh my gosh, you're a victim. You acknowledge it. You're a victim. Like, how can we support you? How can you help you? The only public discourse that you as a victim hear by your leaders is pressure to rush to forgive. I mean, what's that like for a victim? Can anyone, I don't even know. I can't imagine. The other thing that I've wondered as well is because we missed the step of even just talking about it and making sure that everybody who was around him and spent time with him had, felt safe that time, we 
as an entire ward kind of jumped over that and pushed it aside. And we're pushing people to say, I mean, if you talk about it, it was like, why are you talking about this? Like we, we've been asked not to talk about this. If there were other victims that they didn't know about, that space was not a safe space for them to come forward. There would, there would have been no way that they would say, actually, you know what, this, like I was affected by this too, or I have questions about this. Even on that level, it was not a safe space for any of the youth in our ward to talk about how they felt. And again, this man had been in charge of the youth since we were in this ward. And so it has been eight years of him either being the young men's president or the bishop. And I, I think, like you, like Cammie said, I mean, we have no idea how those victims are feeling. I can't imagine. And any other victims that were out there, in the chance that they listen to this, I know that they probably feel like we are talking about their business. I just want to say publicly, we are trying to thread a very difficult needle here and not do that. But we're speaking up because what happened to them in the case they do listen to this was not okay. And people who were telling them that they needed to let it go and move on and forgive that may come down the road. That's up to them. Like they're the survivors. They get to tell that story and write that story. But the way that they might feel angry that people are talking about their personal business um, or something that affected them. I just want to say, we are trying to help you the best way we know how, which is when adults find out that children have been harmed, we speak out. And I'm sorry that other people haven't done that for them and that they've been told that what happened to them wasn't important or that big of a deal. It's, it really breaks my heart for them. Um, and I hope that they can see that, that even if they can't understand it now, that we have the absolute best intention towards them and their healing. And that's part of why we're here so that that doesn't happen to any other children or as many as we can prevent in the future, because I can't, I, I seriously cannot imagine even just the optics of the new bishop, right? So the new bishop who was called was the child molester's first counselor. Why? What are the optics of that from a state presidency standpoint? Why in the world would you not call a completely new person who had no association with this person or as little as possible? I'm guessing it would be to have as much continuity as possible. At least he'd been serving for a year. He would know about a lot of the issues going on and it would be potentially the least disruptive to the ward and provide continuity. Obviously, yeah. I mean, that's not does obvious. Does he have authority though? How does that work? Like if you're, when you're a bishop, you call your counselors because you're in a position of authority to have revelation on who should be called. So if you are actually not worthy to receive the mantle of bishop, how oh, do you call someone? That's a good point if you don't even have that revelation because you're not worthy of it. But also, well, of the state, from the state president's point of view, he, he was worthy because God had called the bishop. And so- Regardless so, of his actions. So like, the, wow, the, the inspiration of that ex-bishop yeah. was valid because God put him there, even though he's a child molester. But I think, I wonder if you're also asking about a conflict of interest because yeah. if a bishop calls his two counselors, two people he's close to, two people he's trusts, does that- potentially call into question their objectivity to preside over the ward and the aftermath and the cleanup if they're kind of homies to, to the original bishop. Is that right. part of what you're saying? Yeah, Same that, space that you mentioned. Yeah, and part of what I'm saying is, so if those conversations were happening with the adults and the youth, right, and the person who's communicating that is the ex-bishop's first counselor, they haven't really created a situation where people, like you said, Kara, have a safe space to disclose. Or let's, you know, the new bishop is, of course, going to be doing youth interviews as well. If there were other victims, that might be a space, if they felt like it was a safe space, to come forward and tell the new bishop, I was also abused, right? Courage is contagious. But that's, I don't think that's going to happen when you know that the previous 
you know, that the previous bishop put the current bishop in that position, basically. I just can't imagine how they think that they'd ever find out the scope of the problem with the way they handled it. Yeah. If they ever wanted to. Yeah. Do we know if they ever even wanted to? Well, and that's, I mean, that's a great point, Kara. That's my honest opinion is they're getting exactly what they wanted, which is look like we're doing something, but we're really not. And kind of brush it under the, brush it under the rug and, and, and use the atonement as a way to pressure members to forgive it quickly and forget and victims and family members. And this is, you know, one of the big problems that I've seen over and over again is that the church leaders, they don't want it to be taken to the legal authorities and they don't want people to get upset or angry. They want them to forgive and forget. So it's minimally disruptive to the ward and stake, but also to minimize any legal or financial or public relations implications for the church. They just want it to be quiet and to go away because that, that, that protects the name of the church. And I think that's the words that they use, protect the good name of the church. That's the justification. And to prevent lawsuits against the church, that's one of the jobs of Kurt McConkie. And that actually reminds me of another part of the conversation I had with the stake president that I kind of forgot about was this will look much better for you when this hits the press as these things always do. If you can say, I've had this special fireside or we've had this special meeting that highlights abuse is not okay. I remember in every meeting I've had with the stake president, I have asked him to just make, because so many members got crosswise trying to defend the church's authority and justify this person's behavior. I have asked every time just for him to read the, the statement that's in the church manual, the church handbook about abuse, which is the church stands against abuse in all of its many forms. He has never done that to this day. And that's very sad to me. Like, why? Why not? It, it seriously calls into question, like, why won't you just say that? Is it because that's, like, well, we'll get to why that's because, but I, I don't understand, even from a public relations and legal perspective, that can help make things look so much better. I don't understand why they can't take that ability to say this person is not like the rest of us because we stand against abuse rather than sweep it under the rug. Yeah. So I guess getting back to really the next part of the story is we ran it. So really the tone in our ward and stake was this is over and done with. It was an unfortunate in incident, um, but people didn't want to talk about it. Um, we were renewing our temple recommends and we ran into one of um, our friends from the ward. Um, they're going to be kind of, I don't want to say central in the story, but they're a big part of the story and they've given us permission to use their names, uh, Brian and Natalie Tooley. They were members of our ward. And in fact, Brian was in the bishopric um, before um, the ex-bishop was. And Natalie was in the Relief Society presidency. They're great very Christ-like people um, and very courageous. We ran into them at Temple Recommended Interviews and we said something about gonna we're going to struggle with the question about sustaining and supporting local leaders um, in the Temple Recommended Interviews. That's a standard question that every Mormon gets asked if they want to go to the temple, if they support and sustain their local leaders. And it was like we had this instant moment with them where we both realized that we felt very strongly that the way the church was handling this was not okay. And that everyone around us kind of disagreed with us. So we had this like immediate kinship of, Oh, you think this is a big deal too. And so we went to meet with them just shortly after that. Yeah. It turns out they had met with the stake president as well <laughs> and gone over similar things. Um, even more things because of their relationship with some of the people in our ward from their relationship with the ex Bishop and his wife. Um, they had a lot of information that made it seem a lot more real to us that we can't sweep this under the rug. What happened can't just be set aside and moved on from without it being addressed. Yeah. And so really after we met with them and discussed the seriousness of the charges, again, they wanted to pick my brain from being a prosecutor about 
how to understand the charges. After that, um, we found out that um, the Tulis had been talking to other members of our ward and that the story I'd been told by the stake president that they were having these one-on-one -on -one conversations with the adults in the ward was just not true at all. That they had basically been talking to other people, asking if they were concerned. And more than half, if not almost all of the people they were talking to, really had no idea um, that this had even happened or how serious it was or what the charges were. And so feeling just like us, um, Brian, like Cammy said, had taken his concerns to the stake president, felt like he was ignored. And so Brian decided to send an email out to members of our ward. Um, even though he wasn't a member of that ward anymore, he obviously had ties to it because of his time in the bishopric. they had only moved recently. And so he sent out a, an email to members of the ward that had the ex bishops mugshot, the charges, and just said, you know, we had the opportunity to talk to our kids about this. We feel this is very serious and we feel like everyone else needs the opportunity to talk to their kids as well. And that happened, I remember these August, uh, these emails started being exchanged on August 31st of 2021. Okay. So I actually brought some of the emails because you can't even believe some of the responses unless I read them. And so I'm going to read, I'll start with reading uh, Brian's email. So, so these he wrote, are emails that are written in response. So I'll read Brian's first. And then I'll read a few responses. And again, this is this email is from Brian. Yes. To the members of our ward over some type of just regular e just over email. Okay. Yeah, it's important that it so wasn't he, used <laughs> sent over LDS tools for later in the story. Yeah. Um, so Brian sends an email to the ward. Yes. yes. Ward he, members. Yeah. Every email he had from the ward, he sends an email to everybody. Okay. And. One thing I want to note, and Brian knows this, he had sent me a draft of this email before he sent it. Mm -hmm. I told Brian that I didn't know that it was his place, but I understood why he felt like he needed to send it. Um, anyways, we'll get to my email where I even tell the other members of the ward that, but Brian knew uh, what I'm saying is Brian, this was not a spur of the moment thing. Brian had been, if you look at the timeline, they knew about this back in January. It's now August. So seven months and the church had done nothing. Yeah. And they had taken well, concerns. Except for pressure everyone to be quiet <laughs> that, and to forgive. That's true. <laughs> that's true. And they had gone to meet with the stake president also, and nothing was being done. Yeah. And so. And who I, knows how many other members also yeah. talked to the bishops or stake presidents to to express concern. Who yeah. Knows? I know many people did go talk to yeah. the stake president because he told me that he obviously didn't use any other names. Yeah. Um, but he did tell me that many people were really concerned. Yeah. Um, so I'll go ahead and read this first email from Brian. He says to the ward, to the ward <laughs> says, hello, brothers and sisters. We found out in January, we found this out in January and we were able to talk to our kids to make sure nothing inappropriate happened to them. And we feel that everyone deserves the same opportunity to talk to their children as well. Ex-bishop sexually abused children for a span of 10 years and only came clean after being given an ultimatum by one of his victims. Feel free to call me if you have any questions. And again, he attached the mugshot, the person's name, and the details of the charges. So the first response came about an hour um, later. Um, this person was also in the same bishopric with Brian Tooley, for what it's worth. He said, from before, from, from before. Yeah, the previous yeah. bishop. That's right. Yeah. Okay. He said, Dear Brian, we were deeply disappointed to receive your email regarding ex bishop. When we moved into the th ward, I came to love you and your family. And after serving with you, I respected you for your love of others, your willingness to serve, and your testimony of the Savior. This is why it is so difficult for me to write this message and tell you that it was wrong of you to send out your message. While I am disappointed in the choices ex-bishop made, I believe that the legal process will work and I believe that the church disciplinary process will work and ultimately, Heavenly Father's judgment will be final. Until then, our role is to love and forgive as the Savior did. We should spend more time and energy praying for and serving this family. 
I would respectfully ask that you remove all of my family's email addresses from any further communications as we all feel the same regarding this matter. He then attached um, from the gospel topics uh, link from the church's website, the judging others. <laughs> um, there's a page they have that says, talks about judging others. And this was sent back to everybody. So yes. reply all. everybody in the this ward is, is sitting on their all. phones reading <laughs> these emails as they trickle in, in response to Brian's email. It was a weird day. And just to be it clear, Brian, I, I would guess if Brian were here, his, he would say that his intent was not to smear or besmirch the reputation of the abuser. It would be to, and this is where Sam Young comes in, to protect the children. So Sam Young's organization is called Protect LDS Children. Right. This is exactly what Sam was trying to curtail. Isn't that right? Isn't the motive not to smear, but to protect the children and to put everyone on notice, yeah. tell them what happened so that they can make sure their kids are okay and to protect them further. Absolutely. Fair? And I, it's absolutely fair. So to return I, with don't smear and gossip, that's missing the point, right? Right, right. And that's those, those principles, you can feel those principles are true, but I think that's where the context super matters, right? It's the same thing we were talking about with talking about forgiveness. Forgiving people is a good thing, but when you're talking about forgiving someone for extremely serious child sexual abuse charges four months after or, or less, you know, four months after they've come clean, a month after they've been in jail, it's sending a wrong message. So when you're saying we need to not be judging other people, you're actually saying that Brian, for bringing this to other people's attention, is to be condemned for judging? It gets to this very, very weird, dysfunctional place. Well, and, and not to say that forgiveness isn't somewhere down the road, but we as adults in this ward had not done our part to make yeah. sure that the kids were safe. That, whatever that was, I'm, and I would have hoped that the stake president was inspired to know what that looked like, um, but we had not done that yet. And we could feel it, and the Tuleys could feel it, and the other people who talked to our stake president could feel, we haven't done our part to make sure that we understand the scope of what happened here. It, it wasn't done. We just decided to skip that part and we left all of these children who were in this ex-bishop's care at risk of not being able to come forward if they needed to. And in some sense, it's not fair. Brian was put in a bad position because he shouldn't have to be telling everybody about this. Exactly. It should have been the leaders that did it. And, I, you know, so in some sense, it's just he's taking the fall for something that really isn't his and he's going to feel the backlash, the public backlash of being disloyal and unfaithful. And steadying the ark is a term that's often used in Mormonism to say, let the leaders handle it, you know. But what if the leaders are mishandling it? But the other thing is Christ, if, if you believe in Jesus at all, Christ made it very clear about how he felt about protecting the children. What did Christ say about those who harm children? He said, it's in the, John, email you, you're skipping to my email, John. Oh, okay. Okay. I, I'm going to, well, that's a cliffhanger. <laughs> that's a cliffhanger. <laughs> that's a cliffhanger. Christ has yeah. a pretty strong things to say. I just wanted to speak up in Brian's defense Yeah, because I, I, I think, and you'll tell us the scripture, but Brian is following Jesus when he says we need to protect the children. That's all I'm trying yeah, to say. Absolutely. <laughs> and I just want to, since we're here, well, Public, don't skip what it is. Keep telling your story. No, but I, I want to publicly thank them because courage is contagious. And even though I can completely understand people who thought this isn't Brian's place, I actually agree it wasn't Brian's place, but the leaders of the church was weren't the doing anything. Yeah. And so what do you do yeah. when you feel like people have a right to know and they're not being told and you go to those people and say, you need to tell people and they don't do anything for months and months and months. Yeah. You, you get to this point where you feel like, not yeah. to quote from Zoolander, but you get to this point where you're like, I feel like I'm taking crazy pills. <laughs> and that's how we felt like, and that's why I want to share these emails so that people can see these are popping up on our phones. And even though we're normally, I would say, pretty good parents, we ignored our kids all day <laughs> as these emails are going back and forth. So the next one comes from the bishop. So, so we have this, don't judge other people. And then we get this number from the bishop, which says, brothers and sisters, Brian's email was not authorized by stake president or any church leader. 
Please contact myself or stake president if you have any questions regarding this matter. More importantly, please contact the police if you think there may have been any issues with anyone you know regarding this or any other person where you suspect abuse. As you can see, police have been involved in this case and have been investigating for as long as the church has been aware. As a bishopric and as a church, we take the protection of our youth and our children and youth very seriously and put procedures in place to ensure they are protected. This has been a very challenging time for ex-bishop family, and they need our love, support, and prayers. Please continue to pray for them. Please also pray for all of us. We need to be more truly Latter-day Saints and act in a Christ-like way to all around us, forgiving as we have been forgiven. And I will give him credit for saying that we take the protection of children very seriously. I believe that he believes that. Um, but we'll get to, well, actually, it's the next part of the story is, can I just um, say, I, I do take umbrage with one thing he said, because the Mormon church, along with Jehovah's Witnesses and Scientologists, they're famous for telling abuse victims not to speak to police and doing every they can, everything they can in state legislatures to keep Mormon church leaders, including bishops, from being mandatory reporters and to make sure that in, in Mormon-controlled states, uh, bishops are exempt from ha from being mandatory reporters and so it, it's, it almost sounds like he's saying, hey, we as the church made sure that the police were involved, but I'm guessing that the police were involved because, the, because of other reasons. And it almost gives the impression in this email that he's saying, we've, we've notified the authorities, we've kept them involved, we've done what's right, so you guys don't you know, need to worry about it. You just need to worry about forgiving. I don't know if that's relevant or not, but like I'm calling him on that because the Mormon church – is famous for saying, keep the police out of this. Yeah, it's not actually, we, we missed a part of the story. <laughs> I think when we met with the Thule's and we didn't have a lot of information on this, which is just crazy because we were actually in this ward, um, but they knew the person who called the police. And so while I don't know what and it I, wasn't the church, it was not the church. Yeah. So the yeah. state president became yeah. aware of because Kurt McConkie literally has a history of telling yeah. bishops and ward members. There's a hotline. The bishop calls the hotline when there's abuse. Kurt McConkie, the church's law firm in Salt Lake says, do not involve the police. And that's, that's the counsel that the church's law firm has always given Ward members. Yeah, and th that's exactly what happened. And so we didn't know that it a year wasn't ago. the stake president. This is yet. a year ago, yes. long after Protect LDS Children, the church is still telling its leaders and members to not contact law officials. And yes. they were, the church was in the middle of a lawsuit from 2020 in Arizona for that policy, that, that direct policy. policy that led to children continuing to be abused because the bishop did not disclose and the church did not disclose that abuse. Yeah. So and just it like had Arizona been months, like we, there's that timeline that we didn't fully understand of our Bishop getting released. So the ex Bishop coming to our stake president and saying child abuse, I'm involved in child abuse. He releases him from his job as a Bishop, but does not call the authorities does not call the police. We find out from the Tulis later that they knew who did it. And he was immediately arrested then months later. So there is this time, I don't understand what is going on in our state president's mind where, I mean, he, he tells us later he did everything he was told to do, which I believe he was, he was not getting the right advice from a moral standpoint. You, when you know there's abuse happening, you call the authorities so that that person can't continue to abuse. It, it's just common sense. And it far be it from me to say, but I don't even think it's the right legal advice because the hide thing strategy only works if people don't find out. It makes things look so much worse when they do come to light, like these things almost always do. Taking full accountability and just owning mistakes, people look so much more charitably on that than people who hide. Yeah. 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 I there, asked, I remember asking you about that specific law because I said, why didn't he call? And you looked looked it up. It, he's not required to call. And not only is he not required to call, though, if he were to disclose the information, there were laws to protect him because he chose to disclose. I mean, it was it was on his side to tell people about this, 
but he was told not to do it. He was told you don't, don't tell anyone. Yeah. Don't but we'll get, police. we'll get to that conversation with the stake president. So, okay. okay. So we're in the middle of the emails. Yeah. We're yeah. in the middle of the emails. And w- the way this little bird walk started was John was saying like, thank you to Brian and Natalie for standing up. And I just want to say, yes, like the church, <laughs> We've heard the statement, all of us who have been members of the church have heard the statement so many times, the church is perfect, the people aren't, right? If anything, the exact opposite is true. There are really good people in the church, the Tulis being those type of people, that are far better than the institutional church deserves and who will speak up and say very tough things. Um, This is one of the text messages that Brian got. So someone texted and said, you have absolutely lost my respect. I am blown away. You would take it upon yourself to judge another man the way you have judged ex-bishop. I don't care who you think you are, but it is not your position to use the church tools to solicit emails so you can torture torture ex-bishop and his family. Our leaders in the ward and stake will handle the situation. What makes you feel like you have the right to email my family and I a mugshot of ex-bishop? From a legal standpoint or a religious standpoint, you have zero business in this. And this is the line that just, I can't imagine texting this. I would rather stand next to ex-bishop knowing what he has done and who he is today than a coward like you. Do not send me future emails. You are not welcome around me as long as you choose to act the way you are. And for people who don't like, which many of the people in our ward did not like that Brian took it upon himself to send these emails you at least have to acknowledge that saying unpopular things takes courage and is really hard. And I just want to say thank you so much to Brian and Natalie for having the fortitude, for having the courage to speak up and say, this doesn't happen in my church. Like this is not the way I think things should be run because that needs to happen a whole lot more. Um, The members of the church need to take ownership of the church. And Brian, stand for- I think, felt like he had no choice at this point. If the stake and the ward leaders weren't going to make sure there wasn't other abuse, he had to notify the families himself. And it wasn't being done. And he waited and waited and waited for them to take control of the situation and stop these rumors and share with people, this is serious. You actually do need to talk to your kids. This guy's been in charge of your kids for a long time none of that ever happened. We just skipped over that step to the forgiveness and he could not handle the anxiety of people don't know and they deserve to know this. And so, yeah, I thank them too for having the courage to, to share that information. It was not popular information, but as that text says, like legal, there's, that was all public information. He just copied and pasted it from online. Um, people should have known that this happened and that it was serious and that they needed to have conversations with the kids he was in charge of. Yeah. As these emails are going back and forth, um, we get angry at the church. We get angry at the leadership's inability to address the situation has now caused this to happen and for Brian to feel othered um, and feel like he had to do this. So we schedule a meeting with our new bishop, who is right across the street, <laughs> and he comes over, he right and over. the conversation's pretty brief. I remember it started with, basically, I think I said, I have a lot of problems with the way the situation was handled, and I'm going to get to the bottom of why it was handled this way. What hand in the way it was handled did you have, basically? Um, the new bishop was just following the lead of the stake president, according to him, which makes sense um, since it was involving an ex-bishop that makes sense with the church's hierarchical structure. Um, He talked about Brian's email and talked about how inappropriate he felt he was, or it was for Brian to send those emails. He also talked about the fact that Brian's email was wrong in the sense that it referenced the abuse going back 10 years Um, if he had done 10 seconds of research on, you know, the Idaho judicial system website for, um, criminal charges, he would have seen that that's just publicly available information. Um, 
that's kind of inexcusable in my mind. If you're the bishop of a ward and there's this really groundbreaking thing that happens. Well, you're trying to help this ward heal from something and you don't even know what actually happened. He had no idea. He I'm, didn't know. He he did not know what the charges meant. He did not know that the charges began 10 years prior. He even testified to us that as he served with this ex-bishop, he felt when something went wrong and something as if as if that he had known when the abuse started. That's what it sounded like to us. And and we asked him, we we were very confused about why he would have felt something went wrong because these charges were like beginning 10 years ago, he, he had been abusing children for 10 years, still called as Bishop. And then for some reason, he, he testifies to us that number one, he was supposed to be called as Bishop. So he did the same thing as our state president and then says, and I, I could feel when there was a difference in him, I knew that something had gone wrong. And I just, in other words, he was inspired up and as Bishop, he was inspired up until the point where he made a mistake not acknowledging thinking that believe thinking in Mormonism feelings are truth. If you if yeah. some charming human makes you feel good for whatever reason, then they must be okay with God and living a righteous life. Totally flying in the face of the fact that that oftentimes abusers are super charismatic and, and make you feel really good. You know, Mormons would think, well if this person's making me feel good, they must be righteous. I think it's even a little bit worse than that. The way I view this is that people, like I was saying earlier, did they want to know? Do you actually ask the questions yeah. if you're not comfortable with what the answer might be? So people in that position, if you're not, if you know deep down you're not man enough to actually handle what's go- with the answers that might come out, you know that you're not that type of man. That you're not actually going to stand up for children. You're going to kind of cower and you're going to just rest on. Well, somebody else is doing something. It's not that big of a deal. It's a misunderstanding. If you know that you're not the type of person that can stand up, it just makes me question who are the people that we're calling into these leadership leadership positions? Like what would it take? How many, how many years would it have taken? What, what would have had to get this new Bishop's attention enough to say, Oh shoot, now I need to man up. Now I need to, you know, send out an email myself. Now I need to be that person that Brian had to be. Cause Brian sounds like he was the man. He was the person who was going to say, no, enough is enough. I'm going to actually do what Christ has called me to do. And it's really frustrating that there are people in positions not only not doing it, but looking down on the people that do. So and, and, and doing what he was told. I, I feel like in their, in their head, it's, I did what I was told. We got the same thing from our bishop. We got the same thing from our stake president. And that pushes it all the way up, right? Yeah. It keeps pushing it to like, I did what I was told. Well, then our stake president did what I was told. I mean, he kept asking questions to be like, who did you talk to? Who told you to do this? Like it, it's so wrong. Like we have to figure out where this came from and then deal with the fact that everybody else was okay with just doing it. Yeah, I just want to quickly call out. So silence, I say this a lot. Silence is the enabler. Silence is the killer. And then patriarchy, but maybe even not even to call it patriarchy, a culture of blind obedience and trust in leadership. Those are some of the structural components that are so dangerous. Because the bishop wouldn't want to go learn. Because like his job is to like, okay, stake president, tell me what to do. And I don't want to learn anything that would lead me to not just totally obey my leader and fall in line and handle this the way the church wants me to. Because the church is led by God, the prophets led by God, the apostles are led by God, the general authorities, the early authorities are led by God, which means the stake president's led by God. And now the bishop's led by God. So let's just look up the food chain, figure out what they're telling us to do, not ask any other questions, not talk to anybody else, not learn anything else, not, not even tap into my own conscience or my own, use my own, you know, critical thinking skills to do what's best for everyone. It's literally, it's kind of like a military. I, and I, I think the military is probably better in these ways than, than a Mormon. It's, it's sort of like this sort of like blind faith, blind obedience hierarchy that, that would keep a bishop from learning even the basic facts yeah. about, about his own you know, abusers in, that, under his yeah. own congregation, in, under his own church. At the end of that, you, you end up with a God that you don't even teach. Like the, the God that would put this bishop in this place and allow this abuse to continue, to not check if 
any other abuse happened. Like we push all of that all the way back up to God. And that's the, not the God that we go to church and learn about every week. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. That's one of the ironies of like this level of apologetics is to save your image of the church. You often denigrate the very image of God. And the church does this with the gospel topics essays where the race and the priesthood essay Yes, a lot of past apostles and general authorities said horrendously racist things. Uh, you know, they were just speaking as men. And but but then why did the why were blacks excluded from the priesthood, you know, for so long? Well, it's God's infinite wisdom. And Mormons just need to stop. And Brad Wilcox, the same sort of rhetoric happens just this week with the Brad Wilcox thing. Mormons need to stop blaming human evil on God. And I, I want to point out, you're absolutely right that that is what Mormonism teaches, right? Is look up the food chain. But I want to point out as we've gone through this, like, and going back to the New Testament, that idea is actually anti what Christ taught. In John, Christ is teaching doctrine that people don't like. And he says, try the doctrine and see if I speak of my father, that my doctrine is not mine. It's the doctrine of him who sent me. So even Christ says, don't "Don't just just look at me, (laughs) do it yourself, find out if it is truth. So it's one of the ways that Mormonism differs from, I think, the Christian message is that idea, for whatever reason, it is Mormon culture, it is what is taught by the church, but it is not Christian, like it it is right against what Christ taught. And um, Wendy Nelson's recent fireside in the EU about, you know, exclamation marks. Tell, tell our viewers who don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. Who is so, Wendy Nelson and what did she say? So Wendy Nelson is President Nelson's wife. The prophet, the Mormon church president and prophet. That's right. And they recently- Second wife. Second, second wife. wife. <laughs> they recently did a fireside with, I think, the Bednars to the saints in the EU. And as part of that, Wendy Nelson's talk was- completely focused on learning from Russell M. Nelson's example. And it's the same thing. It's the same thing. Look up the food chain at the prophet. And she specifically gave, I think, four or five examples of things that she's learned from him as his wife that she's asking the saints to follow. And my reference to exclamation marks is she said, put a exclamation mark behind everything a prophet says for the next 30 days. Um, people on the ex Mormon Reddit have really helped her with that. Uh, the most <laughs> egregious parts of what general authorities have said, but the point is, it's but, this. But same she also th- said, "Put a question mark behind." That's right. Anything that yes. is not the prophet. Yeah, literally everything else. So if anyone else who's not the prophet says something, always question it. If the prophet says it, put an exclamation point behind it and believe it and follow it. But it's the That's same. super harmful. <sighs> that it's- is cult like. I I don't like to use that word, but that is a cult like teaching. It's super harmful. And the thing I want to point out is it's not Christian. It's anti what Christ taught. Anti Christ. Christ did not point to him, even himself as the son of God and say, just listen to me and follow me, or just listen, you know, in Wendy Nelson's case, just listen to my husband. (laughs) You know, the only time she referenced Jesus Christ in that entire talk, we're referencing the name of the church, which just boggles my mind how that can make it through like a correlation department that the church has or whoever's approving these talks that they didn't realize how tone deaf that was and how anti-Christian it comes across. Um, But it's the same problem that we saw magnified in our uh, ward and stake. This idea that if I did what the person who's right above me in the food chain said, I've done the right thing, period, end of story. Don't ask any questions. And members need to Put your head down. Right. Just do do what you're told. And members need to take ownership of their church and say, this doesn't happen in my church. And we have seen over and over again how the church becomes healthier for people doing that. You referenced Sam Young. I would also point to, um, I would also point to, well, one, yourself, John, and the way that you helped um, make the church realize why people are going through faith crises and helped, I think, spurn on the Gospel Topics essays. And I would also point to I don't know who you're talking, you're trying What's the organization or the movement? Uh, Kate, the, Kelly Kate Kelly and the also ordained women, the ordained women yes, movement. Yeah. And how there were changes that were made specifically because of the requests from those groups. Of course, those people are excommunicated in the meantime, um, but 
they're just members standing up and saying, this doesn't happen in my church. I don't agree with this. And I think the members need to realize the power that they have um, because I think it's, they do run the church if they want to. Um, and so I really admire members who will speak up. So the next uh, part of the story is after we met with the bishop, uh, we had scheduled a meeting with the stake president, but seeing the heat that Brian was catching. Um, was there, were there a lot more emails than the ones you read? There were, and there were a lot of phone calls. Um, there was a phone, an angry phone call from the stake president. Brian said I could share this where the stake president said, so in the meeting that they had had several months before, Brian had told the stake president that he felt like people needed to know. And the stake president said he wasn't going to tell people. So Brian said that I might just tell people. And the stake president said something to the effect of, well, if you're going to, I can't stop you. Brian took that as enough of an implicit or tacit acknowledgement that when people were calling him, he said, well, the stake president told me that if I felt like I needed to tell people I could. And so that's what I was doing. The, when that got back to the stake president that same night, he called Brian and told him that he needed to call members and say that the stake president did not say that, that he did not authorize this email and apologize. Did you say he yelled? He was angry is okay, what Brian okay, okay, said. Okay, I, okay. I wasn't on the phone okay. call, so I don't know if he yelled, but I can't picture him yelling. He's not really a yelling okay. type of guy, but he was definitely angry. Well, well, and he told Brian he had to call all of those people and say, actually, the stake president didn't say I could tell people if I feel like I needed to and apologize to the ward members for sending this email. Mm, just for sending it. Just for sending just it. Just for sending it. Right. So because of that, and because of the relationship we'd kind of had to the ward, like I said, we, I had taught gospel, the adult gospel doctrine for like four years and felt really close to the ward. Um, I decided to chime in. So I sent an email. Uh, I'll read that one now. So I took about a day processing. So this was the next day, but we were talking and, and praying a lot about well, what exactly to put in the we email. We felt bad for Brian because he was getting texts like this. He was getting awful things said about him and to him. He was getting angry phone calls from members in the ward and the stake president. Like their house got vandalized that night. Oh my goodness. It yeah. was crazy. I mean, people are throwing eggs at their house and the response is outrageous. Like absolutely. I would have never imagined. I would have thought, thank you so much. I didn't know I needed to talk to my kids about this very serious situation. I don't even think people after the email knew they wrote it off as this guy being disgruntled or upset about something, not taking it seriously in the sense that I need to address this in my own home. Like I might need to do that. This man was in charge of our entire mm -hmm. ward. And before that in charge of our youth, there, there's a, there's a problem here. And I am, I cannot believe that people could not see the problem. I did not understand. I did not understand the response at all. And in fact, find fault with the person who's telling you there's a problem, not the person who caused the problem, yeah, just the person telling the you that there's a problem. Yeah. So because of that, we took some time and processed and I wrote the following email to the members of the ward. Good afternoon, brothers and sisters. It has certainly been a difficult 24 hours processing the information shared with us by Brian Tooley. At the risk of further inviting the spirit of contention, I feel the need, because I love this ward, to add a few of the thoughts I've had over the past day. First, many of you may be upset that this email was sent. I believe that it took an enormous amount of courage to do what Brian believed to be the right thing, despite the fact that he knew it would likely be very unpopular. While, while I agree that this information likely should not have come from Brian, I do not fault him for that. This public information has been available for over four months, and has never been communicated, communicated to the membership of our ward. In my view, this information should have been clearly communicated to the ward by ward or stake leadership when the information became publicly available. Second, many people have approached me to understand the nature of the charges against ex-bishop as well as the general criminal process because of my time as a prosecuting attorney. I truly feel that many leaping to his defense do not understand the gravity of the allegations against him. Public records show that ex-bishop has been charged with two counts of felony sexual abuse of a child under the age of 16 and an additional two counts of lewd conduct with a minor under 16. According to public records, these charges date back to 2011 and 2014. 
To understand the factual allegations behind these charges, you must review, and then I gave the state laws, to properly communicate the seriousness of these charges, the maximum sentence on these charges is two life sentences plus an additional 50 years. Of course, the criminal case has yet to resolve, but probable cause has been found to sustain the charges at this point. Third, alert, alerting the parents of the ward to these allegations does not constitute impermissibly judging any individual, in my opinion. Of course, ultimately, earthly judgment is reserved for the courts and final judgment belongs to the Lord. However, the Savior exhibited righteous and divine judgment on many occasions when he drove the money changers from the temple and when he repeatedly chastised the Pharisees for their hypocrisy. While we are asked to love and forgive, as the passage shared uh, from the Judging Others page of the church's website says, sometimes people feel that it is wrong to judge others in any way. While it is true that we should not condemn others or judge them unrighteously, we will need to make judgments of ideas, situations, and people throughout our lives. In other words, in my opinion, we should quickly surrender any idea that would allow us to invite a wolf back amongst the sheep under the guise of reserving judgment for the Lord. The Lord has clearly directed how he feels about the abuse of his little ones. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he were drowned in the depths of the sea. Hmm. Fourth, many may feel that this matter should have remained confidential. There are, of course, many parts of the situation that are none of our business. However, the reality is that ex-bishop had contact to our youth and we cannot know the extent of any problem until we have those difficult conversations with our families. I know from my time as a prosecutor and statistics indicate that sexual abuse of children often goes undisclosed or is disclosed long after the fact. For that reason, I believe that this publicly available information should have been shared long ago. Only then can parents have the discussions they need to have with their children. Until then, there is truly no way to know the scope of this problem. I hope that even if you are frustrated with my message, you understand the intention behind it. I truly want the best for everyone involved in this tragic and heartbreaking situation, even ex-bishop. Like an untreated infection, this issue is already and will continue to divide our wart if we let it. It is the unfortunate reality that sometimes difficult conversations must be had. In my opinion, only through open and honest discussions can we once again come together. Thank you. Wow, well done. I think it's interesting you said, in my opinion, so many times. It seems like you're trying to be really humble and, you know, put down people's pitchforks as much as possible. But I think you handled that beautifully. Yeah, thank you. I like I said, I it's hard to send emails like that. Um, you know, and, and my I was I was listening with my Mormon brain, and my Mormon brain was saying, "You're out of line, Colby. This is not your place. This would be this would this would be the bishop's place or the state president's place to send an email. Your place would have been to be quiet. That's honestly that's what my Mormon brain was saying." Because like, it's like to a Orthodox Mormon, it's all wah, wah, wah. What are the leaders? What do the leaders think? And what do the leaders want us to do and think? There that were people who felt that way. <laughs> there were also, I will say, there were quite a few people who emailed or called me and said, thank you for that. Like, thank you for illustrating how serious it was. We didn't realize. Um, and I want to stress, I really do think most people who are defending, justifying, equivocating about this conduct, they really didn't understand. Again, I kind of believed that if you could just help them see what they were defending, they would be horrified. I think there are some people, the church's pull and its need to recognize its authority is so strong that there are some people, no matter what they need to justify, they will. Like you said, we'll get to the gospel topics essays later. Um, Racism, sexism, polygamy, all those things can be excused by some people and not by other people. Um, and it's because of the church's authority, right? It's defending the church's authority and its truth claims. I will give credit to, there were quite a few members of our ward who thanked me for this email. Yeah. And I really appreciate that. Um, none of them were in the leadership, I'm I will tell you that. The stake president and bishop were not two of the yeah. people who thanked you. And if your intent was to, you know, not notify parents and say, speak to the youth that were in any capacity involved in a little room alone with ex-bishop, if your intent is to notify the parents and hopefully, you know, somebody did have a bad interaction that they'd have a safe space to share it with their parent, right? That's your intent, right? 
I'm not misunderstanding. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if that is a, what I would see is a really, really normal intention, A, did, did anything come out after that? I guess we can either answer that now. But my question is, what do you think the ward members would say if somebody's kid did come forward and say, yeah, this bishop did something else to me? And it was all for all of this anger towards you and Brian. And yeah, and what if what if it actually came to yeah. fruition that some, that this was exactly what needed to happen, and it wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for your emails? What do you think exactly. they would have said if a child did come forward? Well, care the Lord works in mysterious ways. <laughs> um, I don't know what they would have said. Yeah, um, that's a great point, Care. It is a great point. Yeah. Um, and we don't we don't know whether that happened because maybe they would have talked to their bishops or state yeah. presidents that we wouldn't even know. And again, this discussion I think went out to a lot of the people in our ward. I don't know if Brian had every single right. email. Yeah. It still wasn't addressed by the leadership. Like you said, if you're listening to it with your Mormon ears, you may still just be angry that this wasn't. It doesn't really matter yeah. how beautifully you wrote it. Might not even it finish the email. It might be an anger place. And and we saw that with our own bishop. So that and that yeah. leads into yeah. You get a couple. So it's like all these exit emails or letters that that ex Mormons write to their family. They get a couple sentences in. It's like, whoa, I'm not feeling good. I'm not going to finish reading yeah, this letter. Yeah, because contention I don't is feel of the, the spirit, devil, right? right? Yeah. It can't be. It's that thought stopping thing. If I'm uncomfortable, it's not that I'm disturbed because this is a problem and these leaders are acting wrong. It's oh, I feel a little bit uncomfortable. That's Satan telling me that this email is a bad thing, so I'm not even going to finish reading the whole thing. Right. Yeah. yeah, and that I that is such a good point, John, because I that idea needs to die in Mormonism like so fast because the idea that we can judge the truthfulness of something by the way we feel about it. And I'll just give like the clear example to me. If you can watch Schindler's List and not feel insanely uncomfortable and terrible, there's something wrong with you. But those of it, I mean that's True events, right? Based on true events that really happen to people. If you can read a book like Night by Ellie Wiesel and not feel horrified, there's something wrong with you. That Those feelings do not come from the devil. Like feeling negative about stuff does not come from the devil. And I was trying to hit that idea and speak against that idea by saying, sometimes difficult conversations need to be had. When I was a prosecutor, one of the reasons I'm not a prosecutor anymore is I didn't like being involved so directly with the criminal justice system every day because it makes you feel really uncomfortable. And kind of like I told my wife, I was a little tired of seeing pedophiles everywhere I looked because that was my day every day, right? Mm -hmm. Was seeing people who committed crimes and those types of crimes. And it's just a very heavy burden to bear. Now, the fact that that made me uncomfortable doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. That we don't right? need prosecutors, right? Exactly, <laughs> yeah. exactly. Or those, judicial system. Exactly. Yeah. Those people need to be praised for really sticking their hands into the filth sometimes and dealing with problems that the rest of us have the luxury of not thinking about. Yeah. But when we're confronted with those problems, it's not okay for Mormonism to say any longer, in my opinion, again, sorry, being bringing that humility Kara was talking <laughs> about, but... It's not okay to say, because I feel uncomfortable about this or this thing I learned makes me feel uncomfortable, it must not be true. It must be Satan. It must be Satan, yes. Doing evil things, so run away. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah that's a good point. And so Cammy kind of hit the next part of the story already. Do you want to talk about well, it? Should we go stake president or bishop? I think <laughs> just finish the bishop story and then we'll go to stake okay. president. So this <laughs> happened the week our son was getting baptized. Ooh. This email chain. <laughs> Happened. So we had him scheduled to get baptized on Saturday um, with the stake baptisms. So there was a group of three from our ward getting baptized. One of the other kids getting baptized was our bishop's son. And we had planned the program together. So someone from his family was giving one talk. Someone from our family was giving another. They're singing a song together in the middle, our, our son and his son. And um, they decide the night before. So the Oh this, no! You know that they do not want to be a part of a baptism with us. Oh my! Um, so they pull out. We're trying to like redo our thing. The bishop's family, yes, doesn't want to have their kid baptized with your kid because you tried to protect the ward members <laughs> and let, let them know about an abuser in their midst. And what was told to the third family who was involved, or to other people? Well, she calls me 
and sa- lets me know what's happening because they don't talk to us at all. They don't, they don't explain. They don't say, Hey, like we just feel like it'd be best. They could have blamed it on COVID. I, <laughs> they could have done anything. Just lie, please. But they call the, the third a member that was getting, she's in the, um, primary presidency too. So she was kind of trying to figure out what the schedule is going to be like. She calls me because we have to get another talk in there. We were missing one of our talks cause they're not going to do it with us. And, and I was like, that is so strange. Like, do you know what happened? And she was like, well, she starts to lecture me. She's like, well, I think that, um, we just need to put our big girl pants on and, and get, and I was like, do you, do you know what's going on? Like, did you get an email the other day? <laughs> I don't, I don't think she had any idea, but the message that I received is that we're causing issues. Like we're being petty about something. And so they can no longer do the baptism with us. And, and that really bothered me because they had not contacted us since, I mean, we were only meeting with him a couple of days before that, when he was at our house talking about this. But then Colby sends this email and they are no longer willing to communicate with us. They pull out of the baptism with our son. It is just odd. I mean, I had family coming into town. I have to ask my mom to like give a different talk. And yeah, it was definitely a weird situation. And not only that, as they live right now, we see them all the time. I mean, you walk out the front door and you're looking into their, you know, front room because we're that close in neighbors. And so that was just strange. And I don't know if it's a few weeks later, Mm -hmm. he comes over with one of his counselors talking about something completely different, um, talking about COVID because we had decided we had to not go anymore because COVID got bad again in Idaho and our son and nobody would wear masks. Um, So I had posted on the the word facer page, like, I'm like, we, we won't be able to come anymore to church, um, in person. We'll be watching from home doing our own thing. Um, so they come to see how we're doing and he doesn't bring it up at all. And so I bring it up. I said, Bishop, what, like what happened with the baptism? And he just straight up tells us, I don't know. You, <laughs> you addressed yeah, it to you. <laughs> yeah. I am. I was in the house when they started the conversation. I wanted out to take out the trash or something. And so I stumble into the middle of her saying, why did you pull out? Like being, just being direct and being like, what, you know, what happened? And he said, and I, it's like burned into my brain. Well, I wouldn't have felt good about being in a temple prayer circle with you. So we just really didn't want to do the baptism with you guys. And man, the feet, there's so many feelings. I want to say that's like their day, right? I don't want anyone to do stuff with me that doesn't want to, but I wish that sometimes leaders would think about how damaging having someone like you've already talked about, John, who's supposed to speak for the Lord, basically telling you, I don't like you personally because of, and he referenced the email that I sent because I directly said that the stake basically, and I still feel this way today, the stake and the ward had completely failed and abdicated a duty they owed to their members. I would tell that right to the prophet's face if he were here. And um, I put that in the email, and that's what bothered him. Hmm. Yeah. Mormons are famously, and it's probably not just Mormons, but Mormons are famously pass- passive-aggressive, and they're fam- they famously avoid direct conversations. And so I think they brought it across the plains, actually passive aggression. with them. <laughs> yeah. um, so then turning back to the stake president. Um, so we meet with the Bishop. I send my email the very next night or actually the day, that same day I send the email. Send the we email. Meet, with the, we meet with the stake president and he, we arrived probably like 15 minutes before. Um, he very clearly was on the phone with church legal. We were right outside because we were right outside the door. Um, he had asked meaning stake, Kurt and McConkey law firm. Meaning Kurt and McConkey. He had asked a stake presidency member to be there. Um, the stake presidency member was one of my youth leaders growing up, so I was completely fine with that and comfortable with that. Um, and we'll come back to him in a second. Um, did you request the meeting, or did he request? We the requested we the meeting okay. to basically say we agree with Brian, and we're really bothered by the way this happened. So he did not ask to meet with us. Uh, that's a good point. We asked for it. Well, and at that point, we had realized that what he had told Colby yes. previously was not true. That that he told that he told Colby he was taking care of this behind closed doors, out of respect for the family, or whatever it was, and that that stopped us from pushing for months. 
and to find out that some people found out through this email what actually happened. Right. And so there, there's some disconnect there. He was not taking care of the situation. He was not making sure that the abuse didn't happen elsewhere. Right. And so the meeting starts with me handing him a printed copy of the email I just read to everybody that I had sent. I had actually forwarded it to him um, after because he wasn't on the original email thread, but I forwarded it to him so he had access to it before the meeting. And basically the meeting starts with me sliding the email across the table and saying, I am willing to be corrected if I've said anything in here that is wrong. Let's just have a conversation about this because we want to figure out if we've said anything wrong or done anything wrong because we don't feel like we have. And the first words out of his mouth and the most common words out of his mouth for this meeting was, I can neither confirm nor deny <laughs> anything you've put in this email. I, I'm not kidding. That was what he said. Which was, is like many times. Which I can't is legalese, right? I can't confirm or deny. I mean, you're an attorney. Yeah. Yeah. Is that legalese? Yeah, I mean, it's... Movie legalese. Yeah, it's from an episode of Law and Order, I think. Um, but was he trying to protect himself? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, he was primarily concerned with establishing he'd done nothing wrong. And I, Cammie already kind of hinted at this, but basically what he continued to say was, I have done everything church legal has asked of me. And for some reason... He thought that that was like a magic word defense that would stop us from being concerned about what the way he had handled the situation. Um, do you have any more thoughts about that? Cause that really bothered you. I mean, yeah, I, I mean, I got heated and which is weird for me. I don't usually yell at people or get <laughs> angry. Why were you so angry? Well, because he just said, I did everything I was told. And I said, who told you to do that? Like who told you, First, not to call the authorities. Who told you not to tell the people in our ward that you would put a child molester in charge of them? Like, who told you not to say that? I don't care what kind of person you are. When that happens, you make sure the other kids he was in charge of are safe. Like, you can't skip over that step because it hurts your feelings or you have to question a decision that You're you made. You're embarrassed. Yeah. Right? Makes you look bad. I, right? And I said, I, I think I yelled eyes. Like, are you a human being? Like, do you feel good about the decisions you made? Like you, not I did everything I was told. Do you feel good about that? I'd like to believe if I was in that situation, I would have said, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Release me from my calling. I am going to make sure all these kids are safe. But he did not see any of that. He just kept saying, I did everything I was told. I did everything I was told. And I just, it like festered inside of me in that moment because I, I just, I could not make him see this is not what a good person does. Like, I believe you're a good person. Something's wrong here. Something's not going right. You've been told bad information from the church. You can't believe as a good human Christ-like being that you did the right thing by not notifying the parents that a child molester was with them and in charge of them and planning their activities and meeting with them one-on-one. -on -one. You can't tell me that because I don't believe that. I don't believe that a good person would say, oh yeah, I, I still think that was a good idea. I still think it was a good choice, but he, that's what he did. Really quick, I just wanted to do a PSA. You mentioned this before that there was a, that original interaction with your stake president you wish you had recorded. I just wanted to do a public service announcement. Mormons and post-Mormons out there, record where it's legal, record every conversation with your bishop or state president or an area authority or a general authority that you think is going to be relevant to the health and safety of or the informed consent of members, of yourself, you know, because that that's the only trans, you know, if Brad Wilcox, if 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 we hadn't have been able to record the Brad Wilcox stuff. Just like he's been saying this stuff for years, it would have never come to light. And if I hadn't have recorded my stake president, my interactions with him prior to my excommunication, no one would would know really why I was excommunicated. And, you know, uh, it, it takes whistleblowers who record these conversations that can then bring them to light and, and allow for transparency. And so I just, I had to throw, I was going to say that before I forgot. I, I had to throw that in now. Keep recording and even like private trainings, regional trainings, area trainings, you know, record stuff, not to hurt anyone, but to, to allow for the sunlight 
of transparency to disinfect the church. Right. Because the church won't clean up its own mess. And that that is that's a great <clears throat> note, John. And it's actually something that really irritates me about this whole interaction. So the stake president was unwilling to confirm or deny anything that was in my email. He was unwilling to ever substantively en- substantively engage over email. And we'll get to this. Because it's part a written record. Because it's a written record. That's it can exactly be used right. Later in a court of law. And I just want to point out to believing members who might listen and say, oh, no, 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 I don't like that, John. That makes me feel uncomfortable because it might make the church look bad. Again, isn't it Jesus Christ who told us to record everything that happens? Like, how can you... In the Doctrine and Covenants? That is one of the... I think it's in Third Nephi, but that's one of the things that boggles my mind from, like, putting myself in the stake president's shoes. Again, this is about the system. It's not about finding fault with him as a person. But how can you feel like you're on the right side of something when your side tells you, well, don't put anything in writing, don't like confirm anything, don't deny anything. Like, is that like, that's not the Mormonism I was raised in, which like I said, is do what is right. Let the consequence follow. Like it bothers me so bad that members accept and make that latitude for leaders. Because I, again, I think it's anti-Christian to say, well, our side can't put anything down in writing. Like it's so ridiculous to feel like you're on the right side when you have to have no paper trail. I don't, I don't mind people reviewing my emails that I've sent on this topic because I stand by what I said. The only reason you don't want a paper trail is so that you can shift the story later. And I, I would echo what you said. I wish I would have recorded these interactions, but the truth was I didn't know at the time. And well, not only did you didn't know we were living in this space of full trust in, in the church, I had full trust in my stake president. I, I would never have expected even the first meeting going the way that it did coming back saying he doesn't want to tell, tell people about this. He, he didn't do what was right. I truly believed even after the second meeting, I could not believe how the meeting went. I thought he was going to say, I see now. I see now. I'm so sorry. I am a good person. I am so sorry. I'll fix we it. We should have made, yeah, we should have made sure these kids were safe. We missed that part. We were wrong. Like, and I just, it just blows my mind to this day, but it still is. No, we can't confirm that. We did what we were told. Nothing went wrong here. Haven't you heard our, he even referenced, didn't you hear our message on forgiveness? Didn't you hear our talks? We addressed this. And I just thought this, this was not addressed at all, at all. I wouldn't have known if I had a youth, like a youth that was in his care, which I am very grateful that I didn't, but there are many who did. I wouldn't have known that I needed to speak to my kids about it. Yeah. Based on the, with the way that, meeting, well, with mean. the way that it was handled yeah. with, with any information that we got from our state president to our ward, I would not have known. And so it wasn't taken care of. It wasn't taken care of in a way that was safe. And I think one of the things, again, you know, I'm an attorney, so I ask people questions sometimes to get down to what they're actually saying. One of the things that he did confirm multiple times, and I asked multiple times, was who actually made this decision? Because we hear this all the time in the church, right? The stake president has keys. The prophet has keys. Area authorities have keys. Um, They have special priesthood responsibilities. This is what they mean by keys, right? I asked over and over again. So who made the decision with the way this was going to be handled to say nothing, basically? He specifically told me that the church legal department made that decision. And I w- I kind of challenged him and said, so it wasn't you. He said, no, 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 it wasn't me. And I said, it wasn't you know the area elder that comes into the story here in just a second. He said, no, no, no. He definitely knew about the situation, but church legal made the call. And so that's another part of this story that I just need active members to understand is like when you raise your hands during general conference or a state conference the next time, and you're sustaining and agreeing to uphold the leaders of the church, you need to understand that sometimes the decisions you're saying you're going to sustain are made by lawyers who are making those decisions because of the church's financial interest. That's the reason that he was given the advice. He was, I know how this works. And I told him right to his face when he told me that, that it was disgusting to me and that I was disgusted that he went along with it. But Colby, maybe they're inspired lawyers. 
<laughs> that's true. That's true. I work in the public sector. They make more than me. <laughs> that's really interesting. Like that's a super big connection. I'm glad that you pointed that out for Mormons to understand that you're sustaining who they put in. At the end of the day, it's the lawyer's decisions on how these get handled. And you, you're thinking it's people in authority. You're thinking they have a revelation from God that this is covered and God's happy with it. But they're really kicking the can to the lawyers who have a different interest. Yeah, which really makes me wonder. I've acted as an institutional lawyer like that before, and it really makes me wonder if those law. I mean, I wasn't part of those conversations, but in my mind, that's crossing the line. Lawyers are supposed to give advice and let the principals, the decision makers, make the decision. So either my stake president is lying or I have some concerns about lawyers making those decisions for stake presidents. Um, I can just say, because I try and have charity for the stake president, I can say he was put in a really difficult position, but this is again where my point of church members, you need to wake up and take ownership of your church comes in. If you're uncomfortable with a lawyer telling you you're going to handle it this way and it disagrees with your conscience, speak up and say, you can release me if you don't agree, but I'm not going to do that. Or you can say, I'm going to tell people you want to help me do it in the way that exposes us as little as possible legally. Cause that's completely something the church lawyers could have done. One of the things I think that's important to know is in this conversation, the stake president kept referencing church legal and he kept referencing the Idaho statute that makes clergy gives clergy an exception from mandated reporter statute. Like you referenced John. And the important thing is that, law, and I told the stake president this in our meeting, that law only protects confidential communications that happen in a confessional type relationship, right? So as soon as this information became public, as soon as the charges were filed, communicating the public information is not in any way violating that law, but the stake president continued to insist that he could say nothing because of the statute. And even if he were right about that, like even if he were right that it applies, the important thing to know, like Cami said, is this statute doesn't excuse you from saying anything or, or it, all it does is ex it excuses you from being mandated to say anything. It doesn't say you can't say anything under certain circumstances. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I'd just say from my training, uh, in my psychology program, uh, there's this really, really famous study called the obedience to authority study, uh, led by a researcher named Stanley Milgram. Mm -hmm. And they were trying to answer the question, uh, how did so many Germans participate in the Holocaust? Like it's, it's one thing if Hitler was a crazy maniacal narcissist or whatever racist guy, but like tens or hundreds of thousands of Germans all went along with mm -hmm. it. So it can't be that they're all yeah. evil. So what happened? And it's this experiment that they replicated where they basically brought in uh, participants to administer shock, what they thought was a shock uh, to somebody who was, you know, involved in some sort of educational thing. And every time they got an answer wrong, they believed that they would be shocking the, the learner. And every time they administered a shock, they would turn up the voltage and then shock the next time at a higher level. And they found that two thirds of the participants would administer lethal levels of the shock such that the participant was literally an actor, of course, was shouting and screaming and then going silent in response to the shock. Two thirds of the people would administer the lethal level of shock. And all that it took was a, a person in a lab coat with a clipboard over them saying, you must continue the experiment. You must continue the experiment. And what it just shows is that we're wired to obey authority as humans. And the cost of that is turning off your conscience. That, it, it, you know, your stake president and your bishop, you know, that they, they believed that they were operating in a system where every, all the leaders are inspired, all the leaders are going to do what's right, all the leaders are going to protect them, which may or may not be true. And so what we learn as Mormons to do is turn off our conscience, turn off our critical thinking, turn off our conscience, and bow our heads and obey. And literally in temple, in the Mormon temple, you raise your arm to the square, you bow your head, and you say yes. Bowing your head to say yes means I will obey. I will do what I'm told. And what's the what's one of the covenants you make in the temple? The law of obedience. To obey your leaders. To obey God, 
and your and the leaders who speak for God. And so that's what's so systemically dysfunctional about this system is that we're culturized to ignore our consciences, to shut off our critical thinking, and to obey our leaders. And that's what your stake president, in effect, he was operating under that system. That's why it's systems, not people. Mm-hmm. At the end of the day, they've trained us to obey their authority and to not question. You know? Right? Yeah. No, that's that's all very true. Um and I, I would even point out, I think the language of the temple is even a little stronger. I think you covenant to give your entire life, if necessary, everything you are, everything you have to the church. Um, and so I think you can see where that devotion comes from. This isn't some outlier. I think like you said, John, that's why we're speaking up and it's not about finding fault with the stake president, right? It could have been any number of otherwise good members of the church in that seat and they could have been put in the exact same situation. Yeah. Yeah, super hard. Was there anything else about the stake president's meeting that you wanted to talk about? I kind of want to talk about the presidency member. But. Oh, I mean, I think that you directly asked him about how he was handling it and that you had, he said, I feel like you've lied to me, um, oh. that you hadn't taken care of this like you told me you were. Um you can tell him what he what he told you. Yeah, so I worded it very carefully because I didn't want to accuse him of lying to me. But what Cammy's referencing is the fact that he had told me that they were having these one-on-one conversations, and I'd since found out that that wasn't happening. And so I worded it very carefully, but basically said, I, President, you told me this, and I feel like I was lied to, or I walked away with a false impression, and that's the only reason that we're here four months later, is I felt like you assuaged my concerns when you weren't really doing what you said you were doing. And so what he, well, first he denied that he said that. And then he realized that that wasn't super helpful. So he was like, okay, well, tell me what you thought I said. So I explained. And then he said, well, here's what I meant. When the youth are going into their interviews with new Bishop, who again, remember was ex bishops, first counselor, they were being asked at the end of the interview, is there anything else you want to talk to me about? That's what the stake president pointed to as like trying to determine the scope of the problem. And I responded, you know, you mean the standard question they ended, they ask at the end of every single interview. And he said, yeah, that, that was what they felt like was doing adequate levels of investigation or trying to determine the scope of this problem was doing absolutely nothing out of the ordinary, not, and I'm not saying that I would have rather that the new Bishop be asking about it directly, but the idea that, especially to the kids, cause he was talking about talking directly to the kids, but this idea that like, well, we gave people a space to speak up. I think one of the things we need to learn is sometimes we need to ask questions and not just expect members to bring their concerns to the leaders. One of the the other things the stake president continued to insist on during this meeting was I didn't know people thought I wasn't handling this correctly. People needed to bring their concerns to me, which of course the first thought in my mind is, well, what about revelation? What about discernment? But in the course of that same conversation, he talked about, aside from just us and the Tulis, at least six other people who had brought concerns to him about how it wasn't being handled correctly. And so part of me thinks, how can you even like with a straight face say, well, how am I supposed to know if people don't tell me I'm handling it correctly? Like if the recurring theme is people are telling you you're not handling it correctly, I think maybe it's time to have some humility on the part of church leaders and say, then maybe we're not handling it correctly. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Man. Okay. So not a great interaction with your stake president. No. And I, so I referenced that the stake presidency member was there I will say to his credit, he said that the stake president had basically been handling this situation all on his own. And he looked, I don't want to speak for him, but to my eyes, because I know him, he looked absolutely horrified at some of the stuff coming out of the stake president's mouth. And he specifically said at the end of the meeting, president, I don't feel like we've given you very good counsel as your counselors that we need to talk a lot more about how to handle this situation correctly And again, we had an offer to like counsel with us going forward, Cammie and I, that never happened. Um, 
that, like I said, that stake presidency member was one of my youth leaders growing up. And I don't know the stake president as well as I know the stake presidency member. And I think one of the things that really has just been really hard for me through this whole situation is when you have people who've known you since you were like a youth and they know your integrity, they know your heart, they know that you're not trying to criticize anyone personally. You're just saying, I don't like the way the situation was handled. Help me understand if I don't understand part of it. To then not like speak up or like check in, like really hurts uh, personally to not have people care enough to like check up on how you're doing when they know you're going through something because you've come and told them you're going through something. It just makes relationships in the church feel very shallow and like there isn't really Christ-like love or charity behind them. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's one of the ironies is we we are Mormons, I think, subconsciously, if not consciously, in part because we feel like the community is so amazing. And it and I, I use this analogy sometimes that we're we're like cogs in a machine because as long as we all play our role as a cog, which is a little bit impersonal, but that's how it ends up being, the machine works great if all the cogs play their role. But as soon as one cog gets out of line, um, it all breaks down and all these people that you've been serving for years that you served them, they served you. You thought, you know, you loved them. You thought that they loved you. If you, if you're a cog that steps out of line, the machine grinds to a halt for you and the, the community evaporates and your leaders aren't there for you. Your friends, your ward members often aren't there for you. It's not always there. Are, there are exceptions to this rule, but Margie and I were just, we were we were shocked at how our North Logan ward community completely disappeared and or abandoned us. Once I spoke out against as a cog spoke out against injustice or harm that was being done. It just disappeared. It was like a ghost town. It was like a spiritual and a societal communal ghost town. Yeah. And I, you know, I do appreciate the members who did reach out like after the emails and say, we agree with you. Thanks for doing this. But I think there's something to be said of the fact that the church like scares people enough that most of those conversations were private. There were very few people who were willing to reply all on that email or talk at, you know, talk to people at church and say like, no, I agree with Colby and Cammy. They did the right thing. Um, because just like you're saying, like if you're the the squeaky wheel, the church just doesn't really deal with squeaky wheels all that well. And I just wish the people who, I wish people would look around and realize that we're all squeaky wheels in one way or another, and that we need to like speak out and, and speak out about the things that bother us. Because if a lot of people speak out and we see this over the church's history, if a lot of people speak out, the church changes, the brethren get a revelation and the church changes. And, um, that's what I want people to do is like have the courage to speak out and say, this doesn't happen in my ward. This doesn't happen in my stake. Not, not with me being, you know, the leader or being part of it. I'm not okay with this. Yeah. Yeah. And this leads right into to a couple weeks after the stake president decides to address it in. So after this meeting where he says he's not going to do anything and it's because of this Idaho code law, he, he decides that he's going to call all the adults for the last five minutes of church into the culture hall to have a discussion about something. So he says he, they announced that in sacrament meeting. He's there during our sacrament meeting and then says at last five minutes of Sunday school, just everyone meet in the culture, all the adults. And so do you want to share how that fell? <laughs> and he was blaming his prior action on some Idaho law, some yeah. obscure Idaho law saying he couldn't talk. About yeah. That. So the way this started, he was reading a prepared statement. I wish we had again, audio of this prepared statement. Because it was prepared, we have asked him at least three times to read it. And the thing that's so funny is this statement upset Cammie a whole lot, me less so. I don't know why. She wanted a copy of it, and I insisted, well, let's just ask him for a copy of it, and let's reread it and see if just our feelings were, if we were feeling defensive, if we felt singled out, and it's not really there when we read the text of the, the statement. 
He refuses to send it to us, which again, just kind of comes back to my comment of how can you think you're on the Lord's side when you can't put anything in writing? That just boggles my mind. But the, so he reads this prepared statement, which I'm sure was reviewed by church legal. The primary concern clearly was establishing that he had done nothing wrong (laughs) because it started, if I remember, I might be barely paraphrasing, but I think the first sentence was, I am here today because there are people in your ward and in our stake who feel like I have not handled the situation with ex bishop correctly. And then you see everybody look at us. <laughs> by the way, at least tell that. That's it feels how I that felt. Way. I feels mean, that way. Yeah. when you get up and say that, the Tulies aren't in our ward, right? So we're the only ones there who had had an impact on this email chain, which everybody yeah. knows about and is secretly talking about. And he says, "I'm here. I have to have this hard conversation with you now." Because some people feel like this wasn't handled correctly. He never says himself that he feels like he mishandled it. He doesn't be the leader that we hope that he would have been and say, I can see that your ward is confused. I can see that your ward is suffering and that there's contention here and that there's fighting going on here. And because I'm called as your stake president by God, I feel like I need to step in and let you know what's really going on because I was wrong and I should have done this earlier. And these conversations needed to have place. And I was kind of unsure about how to handle it, but now I really do feel like it needs to be addressed. That would have felt like a leader. That would have felt like a man of God coming in and being humble and saying, I can see now that I didn't handle this correctly. But at least what we heard, which I don't know, and he could change the statement now and send it to us so that we're completely wrong. But what I felt in that moment was some people don't like the way that I did this, but let me just tell you, I did it right. And yes, your ex-bishop was arrested for child abuse. If you feel like you should talk to your kids, do it. It was extremely short, probably less than 30 seconds. He tells us at the beginning, there will be no comments. There will be no questions. I will immediately walk out with his little posse. He just like walks out like like he has all these bodyguards around him. He says, I'll be in my office after if you want to talk. And I just, we got out of there as fast as we could because we could just feel the heat on us. And I'm not sure that he thought that through and thought, hey, I wonder how the reddishes would feel if I say this and Blame it on them, which is how it felt to us that he had to do this now because there were some people who weren't happy about it. But he did again, um, to your question about referencing the law, John, he did again, even though I'd corrected him like a week or two before, he did again point to this section of law that just says he's not a mandated reporter. And he was representing that statute as saying more than it says. He was saying, and that prevented me from saying anything, which isn't the case. It's just an exception from the requirement to say anything. And it only applies to confessionals anyways. So the message he was sending that I couldn't. Oh, and he wasn't a confessor. Yeah. Well, not with the publicly available information, right? Yeah. yeah. Because once it hits publicly available information, it wasn't in a confidential confessional. Yeah. And that was part of what Brian and I were saying in those emails. And so yeah. he's directly referencing that. And what, what everyone needs to know is that the Mormon church works really hard to control state legislatures and to make sure that these types of exemptions exist with bishops and state presidents so that they are protected in their non-reporting to law officers. So for the church to be pointing to these laws when they were, in, in effect, the authors of them is a, is, is deceitful in a way. It is. And I'd also point to the fact that this is coming from a lawyer, that there are all sorts of things that you can do legally that are unethical. Yeah. And it's very telling and scary to me that the church defines its duty to its members and to children who may have been abused by what the law absolutely requires them to do. They were willing to do no more than what they were absolutely required to do. In my opinion, they had a clear duty when the information became public to communicate that to all the adults of the ward so that they could have those convers so that the adults could have those conversations with their kids and they could actually find out if other kids had been affected and abused. Because 
the way they handled it with skipping right to forgiveness, skipping to let's not talk about this, skipping to sweeping it under the rug, they will never know, and I've told both the stake president and that presidency member this, they will never truly know the extent of this problem. There could be other victims out there that, of course, they're not going to feel comfortable to come forward when they see other victims come forward and they're basically getting this implicit message that what they brought is not important. It isn't that big of a deal. It's something that should just be forgiven. Of course, if you were a victim, you're going to feel like, well, why would I come forward now? That, that part is really sad to me. Um, well, it's sad that it feels like, and I can't speak for the church, but it feels like the church did not want to know if there were more victims. That's what the process looked like from my from my side when I said, we've got to take care of this. We've got to make sure they did not want to know if there were more victims out there. I cannot frame it in any different way. I can't see another reason why they tell the stake president, yeah, I probably shouldn't tell people about this. Um, at first, you shouldn't report it, but then it got reported. So then he had to deal with that. But then now that it's reported, you shouldn't tell people about this publicly available information. Something is wrong with that because now I guess it would look worse for the church if there were other children who got abused. But I just can't imagine a Christ-like organization not wanting to make sure their own children in the organization are safe. It's, it seems, it just seems crazy to me. It, it just seems crazy. Yeah, so that that fifth Sunday little five minutes was really tough for us. Um, that same presidency member who I know personally and have known for 15 years, I walked right past him on the way out, and it really bothers me that he – and to be fair, I didn't say anything to him either, but I was trying to process, and he didn't say anything to me. He didn't ask if I wanted to just, or if we wanted to step into one of the classrooms right there and talk about it. And this is after he was the one who had offered to counsel with us about what they might do going forward. It's, and that's the thing that's so hard for me is like, I try and attribute good intentions to everybody along the chain, but I don't understand how you as a human being can know that someone's been bothered by something that's going on have something like that happen, have that person walk past you and not go, Hey, can we just chat for a second? I just want to make sure you're okay. Like, do you, did you, were you guys bothered by that? Were you cool with what he said? Um, I guess I don't understand this idea that like members need to constantly be bringing memberships, you know, that the members need to bring the leadership's problems to their attention so directly. Like, even at like work, people ask for feedback, supervisors ask for feedback, but church leaders are completely unwilling to do that in any way. Um, that really bothered me. Yeah. And they should care about how you guys are doing. How's your family? How are you feeling? There should be a care about that. Yeah. Or if they don't, like if they don't, that's fine. Like, but then don't, you know, and no one's come over and talked to us, but I've told Cammy the one thing that will just absolutely trigger me is if anyone comes over and starts with, well, we just love and care about your family so much. Like I'll be tempted to throw that person out of my house because they know and they've ignored us because we were the squeaky wheel. It's just easier for us to not be there. And that's fine. They don't owe anything to us, but don't pretend like, you love and care about us, I think would be my uh, next point. So even though we asked for the statement, we never got a copy of it because the event had hit the news now at this point, that was part of what I think precipitated the stake president making this statement to everybody was that it was in the newspaper um, all over the state. Uh, there was a meeting set up between the area authority the stake president, the two Lees, and us. The two Lees, I think, took the lead on setting this meeting up. Yeah. As, the, as the meeting got closer and we talked more about it, we really just felt like, what is the area authority going to do? 
we didn't feel like the area authority was going to say anything different than what the stake president did. We felt like we were going to be heard out and then basically patted on the head and told to go away. And so as we were getting ready for this meeting, we decided to pull out and I sent uh, one more email to the area authority directly and the stake president, because we had all been emailing about the week before trying to coordinate this meeting. Um, and this is the email I sent. Good evening. As my wife and I have discussed the situation further, we no longer feel our presence is necessary at the proposed meeting and will only detract from the important mem uh, information that Brian and Natalie need to communicate. This change comes in light of the statements made this Sunday by the stake president advising the members of our ward about the nature of the charges against ex-bishop. While we would have hoped a few things could have been added to that prepared statement or stated different, differently, we would also like the ability to review it. It did accomplish the, important, the most important goal of disclosure. In particular, I am unclear why a statement was not included about how the church unequivocally stands against any form of child abuse and members should not condone or justify ex-bishop's behavior. I am also disappointed to have repeated that the law tied the hands of the church leaders. And I gave the example of the law and said it simply removes the requirement to disclose and it is represented as, being, as doing more than that. That said, our primary concern has always been allowing the parents of our ward access to the publicly available information to stop the gossip mill and allow parents to discuss the situation with their children. Now that that has finally happened, we have nothing further to seek through the meeting, though I do have several things I want to state. Unfortunately, I feel our intentions, as well as the intentions of the Tulis, have been severely misunderstood by our leaders. I want to be very clear that my intention all along has never been to criticize or find fault with ward and stake leadership that have been dealing with a very sensitive and difficult situation. I approached stake president originally in late April or early May because I was horrified at statements being made over the pulpit praising ex-bishop. Even at that point, I sought only to understand why the situation was being handled as it was. We have avoided criticizing or gossiping with any ward members entirely. I have been nothing but open and honest with the leaders about how I would have ex expected this situation would have been handled. I am disappointed that our attempts to be honest and have been misconstrued and met with nothing but resistance. We feel demonized and ostracized in our ward and stake simply because I felt the need to correct misinformation that was being communicated. We know that the Thule family has been treated even worse, having their home vandalized. For example, our current bishop decided the day after I sent my response to separate his child's baptism from ours. The perception we received from other members with the, was that this happened because we were causing trouble in the ward. I then sent on uh, the email that I've already read and said, for what it's worth, I still stand by every word of this email and I am disappointed leaders feel they cannot discuss. I believe this situation was severely mishandled and am disappointed that the primary concern from our leaders seems to be establishing that they made no mistakes. I am similarly disappointed at the continued disunity in our ward as a result of the handling of this situation. However, our faith in the Savior and his plan remains unchanged. We have no ill will towards any of our leaders and those in our ward that seemingly treat us differently. At this point, we just want to focus on moving past this situation and feel that communicating our feelings in this way is the best way for us to do so. And I, I only read that email to note that there was a response from the stake president just to say, thank you for telling us you won't be at the meeting and no response from the area authority. And when you take the time to like draft something like that, and I hope people can tell how heartfelt it is as we were struggling and trying to make sense of this, to just get nothing is so frustrating and so unchristlike. Like when people reach out in real humility and are trying, I just it just is beyond me how anyone who thinks they represent Jesus Christ can just not respond to something like that. Yeah. And this really reminds me of my interactions with my state president leading up to my excommunication, where I know Kurt McConkie was involved there too. And I just think they, they you know better than anyone, they drop into lawyer mode where it's like minimize any risk, minimize any information, any exchange that could eventually be used against you. It's just kind of like, what? how would Jesus lawyer, basically? It's just, you know, it's 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 just covering your, your rear end. And it's not ministering, it's not being pastoral. It's just CYA, cover your rear end. And uh, 
and uh, minimizing the church's legal risks, which is a real, it's a real conflict for the church because they're, obviously they're a corporation. They're literally, literally a corporation with assets that can be sued. So they need lawyers. They operate under legal jurisdictions. So they, again, they care about their members, but when push comes to shove, they care about their reputation, their assets, uh, and, and their authority always, always more than the members at the end of the day. I think. Am I too harsh? <laughs> yeah, but. no, no, I don't, I don't think that's too harsh. I think, I think it showed us. And at this point, I think we understood because we chose not to go to that meeting and we chose to just write an email that we weren't going to get a different answer from an area authority. Um, I think that a few months before that, I would have thought differently. I would have thought if we just keep going up, somebody will understand these are good people. They're going to hear what happened and they're going to say, whoa, something went wrong here. We will fix it. We will take care of it. We're going to change this policy. And the Tuleys I know are still communicating with Elder Firmich. They met with him and then he told them in that meeting, um, if you need to talk about this more. If you still have any concerns, please reach out to me. And he had forgotten though, because they kept reaching out to him over and over again, asking for a, another meeting because they want to know that, that this policy and the way that this was handled, isn't going to continue in other wards and other stakes. Um, and I, they have such good hearts. They want to be told that and they still haven't gotten it. And so they want to meet with him again. Um, but the communication has been difficult and he has not responded. And at one point I think he's, he said, Oh, I forgot. I forgot about you guys. Yeah. So when they had the initial meeting, which they're now six months out from at this point, the, you, the, you decided not we to, decided we were not there. Yeah. So this is instead. according to Brian and Natalie. So this is elder Firmage. Yes. Elder the area with, authority with Brian, with Brian and, and Natalie and the state okay. president. The state president. Okay. He, he basically told the Tullys that they did the right thing, that this was a culture problem that oh. needed to change. Wow. And that it was so important that people like them come forward so that the church can change and that this was very pressing. Whoa. Now, it has been six months and nothing. You mean today? Till from it, then about to now? six months. From then to now. From that meeting to now. Okay. <clears throat> to my knowledge, nothing has changed. Uh, the the Tulis have been trying to schedule a follow-up meeting to see if anything has changed and have been basically getting, well, you need to go meet with the stake president first from the area authorities secretary. And um, I know they're really frustrated by that and I completely understand why. Uh, but I think Cami and I realized, and one of the reasons we didn't go to the first meeting was these policies. When we, when we realized that these policies are coming from Salt Lake, I knew that I could be talking to president Nelson myself and I would get, I would get told that my concerns were important, but I just don't think anything's going to change unless there's more members who speak out. If that makes sense. I don't think this is what I'm saying is this isn't, um, an anomaly. This isn't some stake president that was acting incorrectly. This is the policy. The policy is we do nothing unless we're required to. Yeah. Yeah. And what, what, again, what would you like to, for you, for, for them to have taken action, what is the action you would have liked them to have taken? I think just open disclosure to all the adults of the ward so that they can communicate with their kids about whether or not. Didn't they do that though? In that ward meeting? So they did finally at that point. Yes. And that's why, that's another reason why we decided not to go to that meeting was we're unhappy with the way it was handled, but they had finally, you know, after 10 months of finding out about it or nine months of finding out about it, gotten to the point where they had said, here's the situation. Now go talk to your kids. Now there's part of me that seriously wonders if that would have ever happened if Brian hadn't had the courage to have said, of course, said, not. <laughs> of, course not. of course it wouldn't yeah. have. And that's the problem, right? The church needs to impose upon itself the duty to do that in the first place. That's the policy change that we would, ask for <laughs> that I think if you follow Jesus's message demands, frankly, yeah. 
if you care about children, then care about children. Yeah. Don't just pay at lip service. I yeah, think the, the church's default is cover it up and hush it up and then make sure everyone pretends like nothing ever happened and then only deal with it if there are these rare whistleblowers or dissenters or people right. of conscience that speak up and stir it up and then marginalize and ostracize them, socially excommunicate them, and then minimally deal with it as, as little as you have to, to shut them up and to kind of cover your tail and then do nothing more than that. And I mean, then the, you know, the church put out a press release when there were uh, news stories about this. And the thing that really killed me is then the church is acting like they've done the right thing all along. Like they completely ignore the fact that they were basically dragged kicking and screaming to doing like what I consider minimal effort to protect children and, and be open and transparent. And yet they don't tell that story, right? They just talk about how he was removed. And, and anyways, that part really bothers me that they act like they're the heroes um, when the only reason things happened the way it was wasn't because of their choices. And it could have been, but they chose not to act that way. I think probably the last part of this story is, and this is, this is one of the things about our story that I hope people realize is Cammie and I were like, we've said, we believed with all of our hearts in the church, that the church is what it claims to be. The final nail in the coffin for me with the scales falling off my eyes and feeling like I could finally admit that the church has a problem, that it isn't fully what it claims to be was it, it took multi points of failure. And what I mean by that is, you know, we had ex Bishop, we had new Bishop, we had the stake president, we had the area authority. And the final one is we had an apostle come to our state conference about two weeks. After, it was right after it was right after this fifth Sunday. And it seemed like it was kind of an impromptu visit. It was Elder Christofferson. It seemed like it was kind of an impromptu visit because it was only advertised like starting the Tuesday before he ended up coming. And there's part of me that felt like maybe he's coming to do something or talk about it in some way. And as it got closer and closer, I prayed so much. I've grown up hearing the stories about general authorities, like leaving the 99 at state conference and going and talking to one person. Right. But I know that that's like super miraculous. So all I hoped for, all I prayed for, you were hoping that he would come see you guys, not necessarily. So all maybe. I was, maybe, yeah. but all I wanted and all I asked for was I prayed harder than I think I ever had him in my life. And I said, God, if you speak to this man in some special way, you can give me half, like an ambiguous, vague half of a sentence that I can interpret and say, God speaks to him in some special way. And God knows that I needed to hear that what happened to our family and what happened to the families on our board is not okay. Well, I think at that point we're struggling. We're struggling with understanding why it was so difficult for these men in leadership to do what we thought of at the beginning was just naturally the right thing to do. Um, and we saw how, how much it was this struggle to just get the right information out there. And in turn, we created a space in our ward for months a space that wouldn't allow other victims to come out. Who knows at this point, right? They finally did the right thing months and months later after all the rumors flew around, after no leadership was coming in and taking control of the situation and letting people know, wait a minute, it wasn't okay. We still not, never got the, this was not okay. What happened here was not okay. That was never communicated. It was kind of like a, yeah, I guess we'll have to let you know now that this happened. So if there's anything you need to talk about, go ahead and do it. But this is after this disaster of fighting against each other and sides and people defending, people saying nice things over the pulpit. It's this whole disaster. And we thought, okay, Elder Christofferson's going to say something here that's going to make it seem like 
this can still be our home. Like, it's okay to still raise our kids in this ward and in this system. Like, we wanted to hear, like, this is this is still good. Like, something bad happened, but this is still good. Um, and we got the opposite. We got Elder Christofferson stand up and say, we met with your stake president and we can tell that he is this great person and we can even tell that he is not looking for praise or he kind of went on off this weird rant. Like, I don't think I've ever heard it described that way before, but it was it just felt so hollow to me because of the experiences that we had just had with our state president and feeling so ostracized by him and our ward that I thought he's going to tell us that it's okay to still be part of this. And I just felt he didn't, he had no idea. He had no idea what we were feeling. Right. Or the Tuleys or the other people who had gone to the state president and and voice their concerns about how it was handled. It was very much, this guy's doing the right thing. And this is a state conference? State conference. he speaks at? Yeah. I, I'm reminded of uh, when uh, the Chad Dable and Lori Vallow thing happened and those kids were all killed and these were all Mormons that were involved in the Prepper stuff and the Julie Rose stuff mm -hmm. that led up to the Denver Snuffer stuff. At some point, I think it was Christofferson, might have been another apostle. They go out to Rexburg, and everybody thinks they're going to address the prepper stuff and the snuffer stuff and the murders, and and they actually just don't say anything about it. And it's just like, what are these guys thinking? Yeah, and I know, I know that Brian really thought that Elder Christofferson was that he was going to be prompted to like meet with our family and their family. And I, I just want to stress like how little I was asking for, like I was asking and pleading with the Lord for half of a sentence, like a vague sentence. I knew that he wasn't going to come out and say that the stake president hadn't handled it correctly because the church never does that. I knew they weren't going to do that. But all I was hoping for was if you, if these are imperfect men that are really messengers for God, if they're really a special witness of Christ in some special way, give him half of a sentence that he doesn't even understand, but that I'll understand. And I just, I don't know how to say it other than like, I got nothing. I got the opposite of that. I got told that my concerns weren't valid, that I was wrong. Yeah. Yeah. And that just adds, I mean, when it comes from the top, how much more devastating is that? And that's that's why I'm convinced that I could have been in a direct meeting with President Nelson and I would have gotten the exact same result. I would have gotten, thank you so much for bringing these, you know, bringing your concerns to us and that nothing would have changed. And what adds insult to injury is that those apostles literally were taught their title is special witnesses of Christ. So if they know, if they've seen Christ, if they know Christ better than all of us, then they would act the most Christ-like. And if Christ left the 99 to, to go after the one, certainly they wouldn't have like protected the corporate institution, protected the leaders, and then left you guys or Brian or others just out to dry, literally feeling spiritually, psychologically, and socially left out to dry. And yet that's what the special witness of Christ did in your case. Yeah. And that actually reminds me um, of this thought I've had, you know, as we were preparing to come on this, I was talking to my mom um, who's been really supportive and is a great person. And um, as we were talking, she said that she hoped we didn't just come off as gripey, like angry ex-members of the church. She, she used that phrase. And I realized how nonsensical it is that sometimes for critics of the church to be heard, they have to be the most Christ-like and humble person in the room. 
that oftentimes the apostles can do whatever they want. Elder Holland can, in my opinion, completely slander Matt Easton, say very offensive and dangerous and irresponsible things. Um, and no one holds him accountable. He's not required to apologize or doesn't take it upon himself to apologize. We can have Brad Wilcox say very offensive things and have members of the church telling other people, well, you just need to have more charity for the leaders, right? I know that there will be people who will listen to our story and say, well, you're just criticizing the leaders. You need to have more charity for the leaders. What that results in is that the good average member of the church, the person at the bottom of this hierarchical hierarchical pyramid is basically required to be the most Christ-like person in the room. And the brethren at the top are allowed to get away with being the least Christ-like per people in the room. They're the ones who don't have to be careful in any way with what they say. But if you want to be a critic of the church or you're an ex-member of the church, you have to tiptoe around other people's feelings and carefully word what you say. Give credit to the church for the good things it does. And I just want to say I'm so tired of that. To anyone who would discount us as just wanting to criticize members of the church or lead the leadership of the church in this instance, that's not what it is. We're just sharing our story about how when you have a multi-point failure like that, how it absolutely made us realize the church is unequivocally not what it claims to be. It is not the true church of God, and those men are not spoken to by God in any special way. Now, I'm not claiming that they're bad, evil, mustache twirling villains. I honestly believe they have good intentions, but I wish they would take a moment to consider how even their well-intentioned statements affect people. If Elder Christofferson doesn't know the character of a stake president or of a bishop, be careful with what you say, because there are people out there who are suffering because of the person's choices and being told by an apostle, a special witness of Christ, who even on a higher level speaks directly for God, this person is good. He doesn't care about the honors of the world. He's doing the right thing. For me, it was just, there's like really nothing I could do to move past it. I know so often members of the church ask, you know, how can people leave? I look at our situation like objectively and I'm like, how in the world could we stay? Like every leader along the chain up to and including an apostle completely failed to do the Christ-like thing. How in the world could I still have a testimony that this is Christ's special organization? I think at that point, I think you could, he can articulate it better than I can. But I, I felt what you said. I felt what you said. Like, I don't know what to do with this. Um, but at the same time, I believed in the church. I had had experiences with the Book of Mormon. I had all, all of these things. And I didn't, it just kind of felt like this weird mess that I was dealing with. And I could not, like, there's the cognitive dissonance there. I didn't understand how to make sense of it. I didn't understand why this was happening and why this was happening because of the church's own policies. I couldn't, I couldn't fix this problem. And that's why this, this experience became the catalyst for us of trying to make sense of it. And we started to research and try to make sense of how this could have happened in the church that we choose to give everything to every day of our lives. Yeah. It's so heartbreaking. I'm so sorry. We just hope that, like, I appreciate that. But what we honestly hope is the church is full of good people. That's one of the things I think that makes it so tough. I just hope that those good people will hear our story and realize there's nothing wrong with believing in the church. But I, you need to understand what the church is. And that's what we're trying to do is shed some light on our experience with the church and say, you need to understand that supporting the church means you're supporting this. And if you're an active member and you think that our story is not okay, like we need to demand the church change because it will, if the membership demands that it change. For me, a point 
And I don't know if you guys have other final points you want to make about this segment before we move, before we kind of take a pause and then come back for the next segment. Uh, I'll just say this, that I want to make sure Kara puts in the show notes, the movie Spotlight. Um, it's a really important movie. But what you find out is that it took years and years and years and years just for a journalist to be able to uncover one example without, you know, a shadow of a doubt that there, you know, that there was without doubt a, a priest being a pedophile and then the church covering it up. They worked forever to be able to report on one story. But, but it turns out that like 10% or 11% of priests worldwide were abusing and had been pedophiles and it had been covered up. And the point, the point I want to make sure and make is this is not just an isolated instance within the Mormon church. Like there's a reason why the, why the Mormon church recently committed hundreds of millions of dollars in the Boy Scouts of America settlement. It's because tens of thousands of Mormon boys were sexually abused by their Mormon priesthood holding Boy Scout leaders. And Kara and I will attest that we've received hundreds and thousands of messages from Mormon girls, Mormon boys, Mormon men, Mormon women who were systemically abused by bishops, by seminary teachers, by elders quorum presidents, by home teachers, by their own dads or moms. And the church for decades has been silencing the victims, protecting the abusers, not notifying the law enforcement officers, silencing the ward, um, ensuring, you know, pushing the atonement and forgiveness as a way to create a culture of silence and punishing the whistleblowers who speak out and try and encourage accountability. It's not just you guys. It's not just dozens or hundreds of other examples. Thousands of these instances over decades and decades and decades. And you guys are just among the very first in the history of the church who have been willing to speak publicly about it. Yeah, and I... The other thing I'd like to say, I guess, just kind of in close of this segment is before we sent the original email back in August, uh, responding to Brian, we talked a lot about how to word that. And like you pointed out, John, it's a very anti Mormonism to stand up to a leader and say, you did the wrong thing. But Cammie and I talked about together and prayed about we know that this might lead us down a road of the church taking adverse action against us. Which they do. There are people that get church discipline, formal or informal, for being whistleblowers regarding abuse. That happens. Yeah, and I want to speak to that because we had no idea where sending that email would lead us, you know, six, seven months ago. But what we did know was that it was the right Christ-like thing to do, to stand up for victims and say, no, what happened here wasn't okay, and to say that the church has a problem and that it needs to be healthier and change. And I just want to say, if speaking up gets us excommunicated, or I'm sorry, whatever the new term is, we decided back then that we would gladly pay that price if it helps protect one child. And I just want that to be known. I want my family who won't understand how I lost my faith. I want my kids one day to understand that that's what this is about, that we felt and still feel that we needed to speak up and do the right thing. And we knew that if it led us down the road that we got excommunicated, that the church would be telling us very clearly and unequivocally what it was. Yeah, I think that... What surprised me the most in all of this um, was the way that most of our ward members responded to us. I, and I just didn't see it coming. Like I thought if we let them know that there could have been more abuse or that it's just, it's not okay if we don't make sure that there wasn't more abuse, 
they'll, they would, they're going to understand this. They've got kids in this ward and to see the types of texts that the Tulis got and to see the way that, I mean, people have stopped speaking to us, like our Bishop pointed out the baptism, just, we have just been completely isolated because we spoke out against child abuse. And I, that doesn't even sound like a real sentence that you say, like these people are being affected by the way that the church teaches things. And I, I could not see it before. I don't understand why I couldn't see it really. Um, but the fact that this flipped that light on for me and I started to see things that I had never seen before. Um, and this is before we started to look into stuff that we didn't understand. Um, Something was wrong. Like, that's all I knew at this point. Like, something has gone wrong here. I trusted these people, and I never, ever once thought that they might not be being honest with me. I never thought that they weren't telling me the truth. And it had been my entire life. I took everything that these people said as truth. And then to see this, that they did this thing that put kids at risk— I couldn't accept it. Like my mind wasn't wanting me to accept that this happened because I started to question everything else that I had been taught by the church. And that, and that was hard. And that's what led us down a whole separate path. Yeah. I think the last thing I would say, Cammie's so right. I think the last thing I would say is to, to members who have hard feelings towards us, it boggles my mind that we're involved in a story that involves a child molester and we're somehow the bad guys, that the child molester is not the bad guy. That says enough about the culture and the, the policies of the church. Like that needs to change. That's absolutely disgusting. And I will tell that to anyone I talk to, member or not member, who asks me about this story. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the really dark things about excommunication is there's no real moral or ethical or logical backbone to who the church does and doesn't excommunicate. They'll excommunicate you if they can get away with it and if it won't cause a public backlash or hurt their authority or their reputation. And they won't, you know, like Stephen Barb Young, for example, they're LGBT allies, they've spoken openly, they get a pass because Steve Young's famous. You know what I'm saying? Um, the, the church will give people passes if they, if it's in their best interest to do so. So, but you know, so that's weird, but what, what's, what's also true and, and, and completely heartbreaking and something that we experienced is, you know, I got excommunicated, but, but my, my, my wife and my children, they were socially excommunicated. In other words, of uh, Mormon kids that used to be their friends wouldn't play with them anymore. Families that used to be friends of our families no longer wanted to be our friends. And even if you're not literally excommunicated out of fear on the church's part or self-protection, you are socially excommunicated. And that's, it's devastating because you have to go back and drive around those streets and see all these people, drive by all these homes, see all these kids out playing in the neighborhood, Walk, just take walks in your neighborhood and walk by these houses of people that used to be their friends and it becomes this spiritual, psychological ghost town where people see you coming and then they go in the house. And you have to live in that community where you're being socially excommunicated. And we had to move. We, it was psychologically toxic. We're pretty tough. Margie and I, after a couple of years, had to move out of the ward. The ward wanted us. They kept asking, when are you moving? When are you moving? They wanted us to move because we made them uncomfortable just staying in the ward. And the, I, I, I don't want to say, I don't want that to be a self-fulfilling prophecy of what's going to happen to you, but that's, that's kind of in these Utah, Idaho, Arizona kind of neighborhoods. That's kind of how it ends up happening. And it's, it's a real diabolical, pernicious, um, unethical, unchristlike consequence of standing up for what's right. Yeah. And your kids might pay the biggest price. Mm -hmm. You guys might be okay. It might be your kids that actually pay the worst price of all. And they didn't do anything. Yeah. 
Sorry, I don't mean to be dark. <laughs> That's kind of how you guys started this whole interview, where you're saying, like, I hope one day my kids will be able to look back at this and see that my par- like their parents did the right thing. And I hope that there's enough people rallying around you and your kids, even right now, that they'll be able to say your parents are doing the right thing. Yeah. yeah. Me too. So. Yeah. Well, uh, it, so as things stand, this guy's in prison. Yeah. And the ward marches on. And uh, yeah, the yeah. last contact we had with the ward, um, one of the bishopric members, because Brian Tooley had called them and said, "How in the world have you guys not reached out to the reddishes?" The bishopric member uh, texted me and said that we were on his mind, and the spirit had prompted him to reach out to us when Brian had told me that he'd called him. I just thought that was funny, but. <laughs> The guy, um, he basically said with regards to like the ex-bishop situation, like, well, we just think that the war just needs time and things will move forward. And even then I like pushed back on that idea. And I was like, things don't just heal like this. Like it takes openness. It takes honesty. It takes hard conversations. It takes transparency. Um, He never responded to that message. So. And this gets... This gets kind of mixed into our next part where we, we once that that happened and, and all the confusion came and the frustration and the cognitive dissonance, we started to look, um, look at the gospel topics essays and things like that. But I guess we were still going to church. I had no intention of not believing in the true church. I, I still knew, like, I knew that this had happened, but I hadn't yet made sense of why. And so we, I mean, well, we've been going to church until up to three weeks ago. Yeah. We've been going and we've been trying to understand and we've been trying to participate and trying to work through what this feels like yeah. to make sense of it. I, I don't know how to describe it, um, but... I wanted it to like be something that we didn't have to like walk away from. Like, why would you like walk away from who you are? Like, that's, that's the craziest part. If you're raised in the church, it is so mixed up with who you are as a person. Like you can't just pretend it was someplace you showed up once a week. It was a daily part of who, who I am and what I believed and what I did and why I made all of the choices I made in my life. And so I don't, I don't think it was as easy as, okay, now that we saw who they were in this instance, we, we aren't, we can't be there anymore. It was this long road of painfully trying to deconstruct why that happened and finding out that there's a lot more there's a lot more going on than just this happening. And all of it kind of plays a role in why things happened the way that they did. Um, So many things that I did not know that I, I didn't know I needed to look for because of that. Again, that trust and faith in the leadership of the church was so strong that I stayed inside that box and I had researched well inside that box. I had answers to every question. I was the one that people would call. So was Colby when they had tough questions, but I didn't ever imagine a time that I had to question if they were being honest with me mm-hmm. until this happened. Yeah. Well, that'll be a good segue to our part two that will, that will take up. We'll, we'll end this episode in just a second, and then we'll come back maybe for a a final part. I just want to say that as of February, you know, 17th, 2022, the Mormon church is still um, supporting laws that don't require bishops to be mandatory reporters. They're still having one-on-one meetings alone. Uh, Bishops are still, Mormon bishops are still having one-on-one meetings alone with children, with, with, with youth, with, with minors, men and women, asking them sexually explicit questions about where they touch themselves and why and how. And, you know, the Mormon church is still uh, advising Mormon church leaders, bishops, stake presidents to not report 
instances of abuse to authorities. They're still silencing and hushing uh, ward and stake members, pressuring victims to forgive and stay quiet, uh, pressuring whistleblowers and um, trying to cover things up. And, uh, and there's still Dallin H. Oaks's utterance that the, the Mormon church neither seeks nor offers apologies. Uh, the, the church still refuses to apologize. And they're still uh, refusing to communicate to ward and stake members when an abuser is in their midst. Um, and then they're still, uh, you know, paying hush money to people who sue the church to try and pay them off quietly so that a lot of these, you know, the vast majority of these cases uh, either never get reported in the first place, or if they do go through the legal system, the church pays off and silences with hush money um, the, the people who sue the church to make sure this stuff never comes to light. So that's, that's 2022. Uh, we've heard that the church is going to be making some changes around one-on-one -on -one interviews, thanks to Sam Young. That's going to be coming in the next year or so, but um, just the, the the damage is just infinite. Um, and the church is still supporting the silencing and the marginalizing of the whistleblowers. So, I mean, just there's so much the church needs to change. So thank you for shining a huge spotlight on these problems. Um, and, oh, oh, wow, the church is still teaching a culture of, 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 um, of discernment of the leaders being called by and inspired by God um, and of, and of blind obedient and of the abdication of your conscience and of your critical thinking as a member and the quashing of all dissent and, uh, and criticism of, of leaders. It's still part of the Mormon temple ceremony that you do not speak ill of the Lord's anointed. You raise your arm to the square and promise you'll never speak ill of the Lord's anointed, which means you never criticize your church leaders. All of that is still fully Mormon doctrine and practice in 2022. I think those are all problems. Mm -hmm. I think they're all part of why you're here in front of us today. Absolutely. So. Well, thank you, John. Um, we hope people yeah. will listen to this and realize that you're right. The church has many problems. Um, they need to fix them. Yeah. And if you are a listener record every single interaction with your bishops or state presidents where it's legal to do so. If you think bad things are happening, uh, if you have been a part of cover-ups of sexual abuse, uh, we'll bring on warmer stories. And just like we've done in the past, we will keep telling these stories until the church changes. We know that the church has changed from Mormon stories and from Sam Young and, and ordained women and all the other things, we know we're changing the church at a rapid pace. And so we invite you share with us the recordings, share with us uh, your stories, come on Mormon stories and we'll, we'll keep promoting this transparency, you know, until the church is the super healthy, happy, uh, productive place for everybody. Cause that's what we want. We just, we're not trying to take the Mormon church down. We want the Mormon church to be more healthy for its members and more open and honest to the world. So thank you guys. Thank you so much for your willingness to do what's super courageous and healthy and speak publicly. It's so rare and it's, it's so important. So thank you. Thank you. And Kara. Yeah. Thanks so much for being, uh, being my co-host. Thanks for, I mean, I always am just amazed at anybody who can, like John's been saying, be this courageous and stuff. So I'm really, really excited that you guys were, had the, had the courage enough to come here and share the story. And so we're coming back for part two. Um, we get to hear all the other, all the other things that happen after all of this. So thank you guys again. So part two is going to be about, you know, your faith journey, how this has impacted your faith and how it kicked off the ball rolling on investigating other things about the church, right? That's right. right. All right. All right, everyone. Thanks for joining us for part one. Please share this wherever you can. Thanks to everyone who supports Mormon Stories and the Open Stories Foundation that you make all this possible. Uh, please get the word out. Share this with everyone. Email us at mormonstories at gmail.com for your feedback. If you want to come on Mormon Stories and tell your story, email us and we'll look at the story and see if it's something we can do. 
we want to be responsible, but we want to report this stuff. So send us your feedback, uh, comment everywhere you can, and just share this story with bishops and stake presidents and ward members and family members. And just in the sunlight will become the best disinfectant for the church. So thanks, everybody. Uh, we'll see you guys all again for part two of this episode on Mormon Stories Podcast. Be good to each other. Take care.